Okay, I've, we're, we're about ready to start. If uh, people could take their seats, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I'm uh, Joe Antos with the American Enterprise Institute, and I want to welcome everyone here for this uh, conference and for uh, Secretary Azar's uh, uh, speech. Uh, we're really pleased uh, that you could make it. We're really pleased that the Secretary could make it. We're really pleased that the panelists could make it. Um, uh, my job is uh, to uh, introduce um, Bill Kramer. Bill Kramer is the Executive Director for National Health Policy of the Pacific Business Group on Health, the Pacific Business Group and uh, Brookings Institution, uh, uh, our co-sponsors uh, with AEI of this event. We're grateful to both of them and we're grateful to all of the speakers. Uh, Bill? Thank you, Joe, and good morning, uh, and welcome to everyone here in the audience and those who may be uh, listening in via live stream. Uh, we're encouraged and exceptionally pleased by the uh, tremendous turnout and the high level of interest uh, in the topic today, fixing health care, driving value through smart purchasing and policy. The Pacific Business Group on Health is a consortium of large employers uh, dedicated to driving improved value lower costs and improved quality throughout the U.S. healthcare system. And we're very glad to be a co-sponsor of this event with the American Enterprise Institute and with the USC Brookings Schaefer Initiative for Health Policy. I'm very pleased this morning to introduce our keynote speaker, Secretary Alex Azar. Alex Azar was sworn in as Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services in January of 2018. He has spent his career working in both the public and the private sectors as an attorney and in senior leadership roles focused on advancing healthcare reform, research, and innovation. From 2001 to 2007, Mr. Azar served at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, first as general counsel and then as deputy secretary. In 2007, he rejoined the private sector as a senior vice president for corporate affairs and communications at a large manufacturing company and served as president of that company's largest affiliate. Earlier in his career, Mr. Azar clerked for U.S. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia before practicing law for several years. On behalf of the event's co-sponsors, I would like to express our appreciation for Secretary Azar's support for the value agenda, especially the importance of consumers' access to health data, transparency, and healthy competition to drive down costs and improve quality. We also support and appreciate the department's statements of support for innovation, especially new value-based provider payment and care models. And all of this speaks to the importance of the alignment of private and public sector purchasing strategies to drive change and improved value in our healthcare system. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Alex Azar. Wow, what a space age podium, my goodness. <laughs> Uh, and well, and AEI, look at you. You've really upgraded the dig since the last time I was with you. <laughs> Boy. Well, Bill, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, and uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me here today. This gathering is focused on an important issue in our healthcare system, getting more value for what we as patients and taxpayers are purchasing. This is an important priority across the entire healthcare ecosystem, but it's acutely important in the world of prescription drugs. For a long time, there's been a lot of talk about our country's high drug prices, but little action. Drug companies have insisted we can have new cures or affordable prices, but not both. Pharmacy benefit managers have argued that they are successfully holding down costs while being, frankly, complicit in skyrocketing list prices and rising out-of-pocket costs. I've been a drug company executive, so I know the talking points pretty well. 
The idea that if one penny disappears from pharma profit margins, American innovation will grind to a halt. The president and I are tired of these talking points, and I suspect many of you are as well. Talk isn't going to cut it anymore. We understand this problem is complex and has multiple parts. High list prices, overpaying in government programs, high out-of-pocket costs for patients, foreign governments underpaying for drugs. They're connected in a way that attempting to squeeze one side of the balloon won't lead to lasting change because the other part will expand. But the complexity of the problem is no excuse for inaction or incrementalism. There are plenty of actions that we can and will take administratively to shake up the system. There are four strategies for reform set out in the administration's drug, drug pricing blueprint that the president released on Friday. Improved competition, lowering out-of-pocket costs, enhanced negotiation, and incentives for lower list prices. On each of them, we've begun taking action this week already, but we also have broader disruptive plans, something many of you in this room have recognized and pointed out. We look forward to engaging with you on these plans and tapping into your substantial expertise. So what are we doing and what are we planning to do? I want to start with negotiation because it's so important and because there's been some confusion about it. President Trump promised to bring more negotiation and smarter bidding to our government programs, and that is exactly what this plan does. We are going to make negotiation dramatically more effective than it is today in our retail drug program, Part D, and bring negotiation to the parts where it doesn't exist in physician-administered drugs, Part B. In Part B, Part D, it's very confusing, isn't it? In Part D, as in dog, we'll be giving Medicare plans the same negotiating power that private sector plans already have. We know this approach works. Let me briefly lay out one way that this will happen. We know right now that Medicare Part D is not getting deals it should on some expensive, important drugs. There are six types of drugs that are automatically put into Part D categories called protected classes because they're vital to treating some serious conditions. Part D spends about $30 billion a year on these drugs. That's with a B. That's almost 10% of what our entire country spends on drugs each year. Yet Part D plans are hamstrung by current rules from really negotiating over drugs in these protected classes, allowing pharma to run up pro huge profits on patients who desperately need these often expensive drugs. For example, the company that makes one of the 10 most common drugs in these categories raised that drug's price 20% in the last 12 months. That particular drug in 2015 cost $11,500 per month, under Medicare Part D, that means seniors using the drug will typically owe an extra $115 every month. They just went from paying $575 a month to $690 a month at a time when the average Social Security check is $1,400. Now, typical private market discounts for these drugs are in the 20 to 30% range. The average discount across all of these protected classes in Medicare Part D is just 6%. And for some of them, it's zero. The good news is that this administration has the authority to provide Part D plans with new tools to negotiate for these drugs, get real discounts, and bring these costs down. So, for one-third of Medicare Part D spending, we can go from where plans effectively are not negotiating to plans having real power to negotiate. Another place that we need more negotiation is not just high-cost drugs in the protected classes, but all high-cost drugs which are driving the cost trends in Medicare. We're concerned that plans may not be effectively managing formulary decisions with regard to high-cost drugs, even though CMS has approved those decisions because of how CMS rates plans. In particular, plans may be excessively worried about being dinged by CMS's star rating system, even when they're using clinically appropriate and approved utilization management tools. We want Part D plans to get better deals by having access to the same tools used by plans hired by private employers like most of us have. I want to reinforce that we will go about these reforms transparently. 
Part D in the drugs it covers are vital for our seniors. This process will not restrict patient access but expand it through lower cost. It's important to understand that because it isn't true of the alternatives. You've probably heard many times that Medicare could save tons of money by just having me as secretary negotiate directly for drugs. It's just not true, and I'm sure most of you know it. It's appropriate to make this point here at an AEI Brookings event as scholars at these institutions and all of you prize evidence-based policymaking. We're not skeptical of ideas like direct negotiation because of ideology. We're driven by pragmatism and evidence and by what will achieve our goals of being effective, safe, and preserve access and choice for our patients. The Congressional Budget Office, when it was run by Peter Ortzeg, found that the idea of direct negotiation would generate almost no savings. The same conclusion was reached by President Obama's Office of Management and Budget when it assessed the proposal in his budget. Lest you think I'm misreading the evidence here, I would direct you to Peter Ortzeg's Twitter account where he confirmed this interpretation on Monday. The only way that direct negotiation saves money is by doing something that this administration does not believe in, denying access to certain medicines for all Medicare beneficiaries or setting prices for drugs by government fiat. We don't believe either of these proposals would put American patients first. They would move us toward the kind of socialized medicine systems that are notorious for poor quality and access. Our plans instead rely on what we know works, using the free market to negotiate for our patients while preserving their right to choose coverage that works for them, or as the economists in the room would put it, preserving patients' exit rights. But I don't expect ideas like direct negotiation to go away, no matter how unlikely they are to work. If the pharmaceutical industry wants them off the table entirely, the only way is to come to the table with us to engage in meaningful negotiation with Part D drug plans and to stop the price hikes. The president's also going to bring negotiation to billions of dollars of drugs in a part of Medicare where there is currently no negotiation at all. That's Medicare Part B drugs, those administered in a physician's office. Right now in Part B, Essentially, as soon as the drug is approved by the FDA, it's covered. Medicare gets a bill for the drug, composed of the standard almost list price, plus a 6% markup. And guess what we do? We pay it. Compare that with the negotiation in Part D. Plans determine whether a drug should be covered or whether an alternative is superior. Plans negotiate discounts rather than just paying full price. You can imagine what happens when you're developing a drug. It's often more appealing for the drug to go into Part B than D. Better to be a physician-administered infusion product than a self-administered patient-driven drug. So perversely, some drug development decisions are being driven by government reimbursement systems rather than by what's best for the patient. Moving away from the Part B system of drugs, often referred to as buy and bill, is a positive step not only for the patient but for the provider. We don't need doctors in the business of buying and selling expensive drugs. They should be able to make the decisions based on what's best for the patient. In short order, we will be issuing a request for proposals to make new use of an alternative system for buying Part B drugs, a competitive acquisition program. We believe there are more private sector entities equipped to negotiate better deals in Part B and relieve doctors from doing the purchasing. More broadly, President Trump has called on us to merge Medicare Part B's drug program into the retail Part D program where negotiation has been successful on so many drugs. We already have a clear sense of where immediate opportunities for savings exist, and an announcement on how we intend to go about this process administratively is on the way very soon. Bringing negotiation to Part B drugs is such a potent way to bring down prices that pharma is already protesting the idea. This is really on their list of worst nightmares. So the industry pushed back yesterday with one industry group saying they, quote, have concerns about patient affordability and access regarding our plans for Part B drugs. I beg to differ. The single greatest threat to patient affordability and access to prescription drugs in America is high list prices set by drug companies and incentivized by today's system. Negotiating these prices down isn't a threat to patients. It is the solution they need. Let me be really clear about this. 
we are going to bring negotiation to Part B drugs, and we are going to give Part D plans more bargaining power. It's going to happen. So it would be most productive if the pharmaceutical industry came to us with plans for these changes. If pharma doesn't come to us with a plan for which drugs make sense to move from Part B to D, we'll decide that for them. And if pharma doesn't come up with a solution for pricing the drugs where Part D is currently getting almost no discounts, we'll fix that problem unilaterally too. I hope such plans are already in the works because I know there are pharma companies that are heavily Part D, Part B dependent and ones that are heavily Part D dependent. As the president said last week, if you're one of these companies, the gravy train is about to be derailed. Another key way to bring down drug costs is using our market-based system through more competition. Thanks to thriving generic drug competition, Americans get better prices on generics than most European countries. But we can go further. FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb has made it a top priority to stop drug manufacturers from gaming our patent system to block generic competitors. We know that certain brand name manufacturers are abusing the system by blocking access to samples and hiding behind FDA's rules when they do it. FDA is going to begin publicly identifying drug companies suspected of engaging in these abusive practices. In fact, the agency has already received more than 150 inquiries from generic manufacturers about challenges with access to product samples from brand manufacturers so that they can do the testing that is required by FDA to enter market as soon as the patent deal ends. It's time to shed light on these practices and call out the manufacturers who may be abusing the rules that built our free market for drugs. They're using laws intended to promote public health and innovation to pad their profits instead. On top of that, Commissioner Gottlieb is working aggressively to build a market for biosimilars, which we have not taken, which, which have not taken off like many had hoped. FDA was proud to announce just the 10th biosimilar ever approved yesterday, a biosimilar for the anemia drug Epigen. The agency is going to continue work to pave the way for more such approvals, drive affordability for these important drugs, and pursue the end goal of interchangeable biosimilars as we have in our generic market. I want to raise a final point in the context of competition. Many of you are familiar with proposals to give our seniors access to cheaper drugs by importing drugs from other countries such as Canada. And many of you know, too, that this is a gimmick. It's been assessed multiple times by the Congressional Budget Office, and CBO said it would have no meaningful impact. One of the main reasons is that Canada's drug market is simply too small to bring down prices here. They're a lovely neighbor to the north, but they're a small one. Canada simply doesn't have enough drugs to sell them to us for less money, and drug companies won't sell Canada or Europe more just to have them imported here. On top of that, the last four FDA commissioners have said that there is no effective way to ensure drugs coming from Canada really are coming from Canada, rather than being routed from, say, a counterfeit factory in China or elsewhere. The United States has the safest regulatory system in the world. The last thing we need is open borders for unsafe drugs in search of savings that cannot, that cannot be safely achieved. You can't improve competition and choice in our drug markets with gimmicks like these. You have to boost competition and price transparency. And that informs our third strategy to reduce Americans' out-of-pocket drug costs. Today, some pharmacy benefit managers set contracts with pharmacies that prevent your neighborhood pharmacist from telling you when you could get a better deal on a drug by paying cash than using insurance. That's because when you use your insurance, the pharmacy benefit manager gets a cut of the deal. When you pay cash, they don't. You ought to know how you can get the best deal possible, and your pharmacist should be able to tell you how. So this week, CMS will be sending a letter to all Medicare Part D plan sponsors saying that we consider such behavior unacceptable. Ending gag clauses is part of a much broader effort CMS will be undertaking to bring more transparency to our drug markets. We need patients themselves to have information to be smart purchasers. You ought to know how much a drug costs and how much it's going to cost you long before you get to the pharmacy counter or get the bill in the mail. The final strategy we're going to work on immediately is a new set of incentives on list prices. Right now, our entire system, both industry practices and government rules, encourage higher and higher list prices. It's time for drug prices to go down, not up. 
We believe that the entire system of pharmacy benefit managers negotiating, negotiating rebates needs to be reexamined. We're asking a pretty straightforward question. What if instead of the current system where drug companies get paid, where, where, drug, where drug companies pay rebates and middlemen take a cut, we just had fixed price discounts? Right now, we have a principal agent problem. Pharmacy benefit managers are getting paid by both sides of the transaction. The insurance companies who hire them and pay them a fee as their customers, and the drug companies they're supposed to be negotiating against to give them a cut of the rebates they receive along with other administrative fees that are based on those ever-increasing list prices. This means the PBM actually wins when list prices go up. Imagine you take a $1,000 drug. The PBM working for your insurance plan negotiates a $300 rebate, 30% which gets back to your employer, gets sent back to your employer, minus a percentage cut, perhaps, held by the PBM. Now imagine that the list price goes up mid-year to $1,500. So the rebate might be $800, allowing the PBM to get paid more while the patient pays significantly more in cost sharing. Even more perversely, PBMs often have contracts with payers that require them to secure a certain average percentage rebate across all drugs. In other words, to some extent, they actually need list prices to be high, so they can say they're doing their job by negotiating big discounts. I've seen how this system works from the perspective of drug manufacturers. It makes it nearly impossible to cut list prices. If you want to cut the list price, PBMs have no incentive to do business with you. They actually have a disincentive to putting your, your drug on formulary. If you cut the list price of a drug during the plan year, the PBM would actually be on the hook for some of the rebate dollars that it had promised to pass through to its payer customers. There are some PBMs that have moved away from this system toward fixed price discounts, and we applaud that. We would welcome the PBM industry coming forth with broader proposals for moving away from today's system, including a plan for implementation with the pharmaceutical industry. If not, we do have the administrative power to end the system ourselves, to eliminate rebates and forbid remuneration from pharmaceutical companies, to align interests and end the corrupt bargain that keeps driving list prices skyward. We're also going to be looking at how pharmaceutical companies interact with the American public. We already have FDA and CMS examining how to require drug companies to post their list prices in direct-to-consumer advertising. When patients hear about a wonderful new drug, they should know whether it costs $100 or $50,000. A patient might even pay for a doctor's appointment to discuss a drug, not knowing that the price puts it totally out of reach. Drug companies don't have to wait on us. The industry could agree on its own to do this tomorrow. The Pharma Code already requires disclosure of patient assistance programs in their ads, and the industry used the code to end the practice of handing out tchotchkes and trinkets like pens and pads for doctors. There's no reason the same can't be done here. Now, one complaint that I've already heard from pharma is, oh, we can't put our list prices in ads because the prices change too often. To that I say, aha, you get me. We'll go beyond direct consumer advertising. Yesterday, CMS unveiled updates to its drug pricing dashboard, which now highlights the drugs in Part B, Part D, and Medicaid that have seen the largest recent price increases. Some of the price increases are 500, 600, even more than 1,000%. I'll be having regular meetings with CMS Administrator Verm and others to examine which prices are rising and why. All of these ideas will mean dramatic change for the whole drug ecosystem. I should say that because I've been in business, in this business, I understand that companies have systems that work for them and market positions that help them succeed. But markets only work when they're open to forces for change. The American system works incredibly well for so, in so many ways because we have a dynamic free market. But right now we have a drug pricing system that is protected from market forces, that is set up to benefit the manufacturers and the middlemen, not the patients. We in this administration are open to all potential solutions for fixing this problem, assuming they are effective, safe for patients, and respect our seniors' choice and access. I want to be clear about something that I mentioned earlier. Our proposals in this realm are not driven by ideology, 
They're driven by a sophisticated sense of what we believe will work. If they do not work, if our ideas do not deliver the results we need, we will be open to other proposals, regardless of ideological loyalties or special interests. In closing, it's worth noting that the drug pricing challenge is similar to the broader issue you're going to be discussing today. How to secure greater value in our healthcare system. Using Medicare and Medicaid to affect this transformation in healthcare service is one of my other top priorities as secretary, along with solving the opioid epidemic and reforming the individual market for insurance. But in some ways, as the composition of today's event reflects, the private sector has already taken the lead on value-based care. Providers and payers have made real progress on real solutions. I wish the same could be said of drug pricing. But we've given a lot more talk than action over the years. Under this president, that's going to change. We look forward to working with the various industries to build a better drug pricing system. But if industry isn't willing to work with us, President Trump and his administration will keep turning up the pressure until we have a system that finally works and puts American patients first. Thank you all for listening today, and I look forward to working with all of you to make that vision a reality. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Azar, for uh, uh, an amazing, to me, an amazingly clear uh, explanation of an amazingly complicated uh, subject. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, the Secretary has a uh, very short time to uh, uh, take some questions, and I've asked uh, Paul Ginsburg to ask the first one. Hi, Mr. Secretary. You know, given the focus you've had this morning on prescription drug uh, prices, um, what would you say your priority is for the rest of the value agenda for delivery system reform, hospital physicians, et cetera? Uh, so the, it's, it's huge. In fact, I rolled out the basic architecture. Thank you, Paul, of, of, for asking about that. The architecture of this very early on. <laughs> Um, with four key elements that we're trying to drive towards, including uh, greater transparency of price and outcome, uh, including um, using the power of Medicare as a market player to drive transformation across the system, uh, removing government barriers to the kind of integrated, coordinated care that may need to take place in the marketplace, and finally harnessing the power of interoperable health IT owned by patients to drive that kind of change. Uh, and so that's uh, just like drug pricing, one of the top four priorities that I'm personally spending most of my time and efforts on driving. Um, I look forward to the outputs of today's session, actually, because um, we need ideas here. I think there's a remarkable bipartisan consensus on the need to drive towards value and outcomes in healthcare. Um, I have focused on, you know, one of the, if I wanted to mention to this group, because I really would love the input from folks meeting today, uh, I think so often we think the future of value-driven care, outcomes-based care, does require common ownership and integration. Uh, that's, of course, one approach that can be taken, I believe, in markets and competition, and I think that virtual aggregation, virtual integration needs to also be supported, and we have to make sure our government programs, the payment systems, and anti-fraud regulations don't force common ownership and integration. We should be agnostic to that, let the market and economic forces determine ownership structures so that we can have as much robust competition as possible. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jim Capretta from AEI. Uh-oh, Jim. <laughs> Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Hey, Jim. Yeah, nice to see you. Thank you for coming this morning. Um, I wanted to see, give you an opportunity to say anything about Medicaid. It's, it's um, supplemental uh, rebate and supplemental rebate program. The budget, if I recall, had a prospect of a demonstration program maybe for the states to be involved in yeah. some testing, some ideas. Do you want to say a word about that effort and where it stands? Yep. Yeah. So one of the things that we called for in the budget was, as, as you all know, in the Medicaid program, there's a statutory rebate regime where basically a formula sets the rebates that drug companies have to pay into the Medicaid program based on a base rebate, plus penalties if you've given better discounts to other players in the system and if you have increased price beyond the rate of medical inflation. So you eventually have to pay more and more rebates there. Um, 
we are open, and we've said we'd like to find five states, if they would like to, to try to instead manage their own formulary. If they think that they can do a better job than the statutory rebate system and actually do a managed formulary, very similar, I'd say, in concept to our ideas for Part B and Part D in negotiation, is to take the same tactics that work so well for all of us who have commercial insurance and apply those notions, clinically-based, medically-based formularies with appropriate utilization controls. If they think they can do that better, um, we want to open the door to let them try that, try that approach. Um, and we've got, we've got some states that have come forward and we're working with them and looking through their, working with them on their proposals for how, for how to do that. Uh, one other element that I didn't mention in my remarks um, around drug pricing in the Medicaid program, as I, as I mentioned there, if you increase the price of drugs beyond the rate of inflation, your statutory rebate will keep going up and up and up. So if you've got a drug that's been on the market five or six years as a branded company, and you've been increasing your list price, say, 15 to 20 percent per year, which is not uncommon, um, you can, within that time period, get to the point of paying 100 percent rebate on your product. Um, one of the bargains the pharmaceutical industry had for their support of the Obamacare legislation was to cap those rebates at 100%. Previously, those could exceed 100% if the price increases went above that. We have asked to work with Congress to get rid of that cap. There are now over 2,300 drugs that are at 100% cap on rebate. Um, so unleashing that would be a dramatic transformation in the financial incentives towards ever-increasing list prices as pharma executives sit there and look at the spreadsheet calculating how much they will yield or not yield from a list price increase. Uh, thank you very much. I, you've been very generous with your time. I uh, know you're very late for your next <laughs> appointment. Uh, if uh, people could uh, join me in thanking the Secretary. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Great to be with you. Uh, we're going we're to start the uh, panel uh, in a few minutes. Uh, uh, there's a little bit more that has to be done, um, but uh, perhaps the first panel could uh, could join us on stage. And, and uh, oh, well, actually, you could stay there. And I'll, I'll introduce you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think, I think we're ready to uh, begin. Uh, let me uh, once again thank uh, the, uh, the two panels uh, for uh, agreeing to uh, participate in the conference today and thank our, uh, our colleagues uh, uh, who are co-sponsoring the, uh, the event. It's, uh, it's really been a pleasure to work with everyone. Um, let me uh, introduce uh, Annette Harisco. Uh, who is president and CEO of the ERISA Indi Industry Committee, uh, 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 otherwise known as ERIC. ERIC uh, uh, represents uh, large employers on numerous issues of employee benefits, including uh, perhaps especially health care. <clears throat> and uh, uh, let, me, let me invite Annette up here to uh, kick us off. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. We're so pleased to hear directly from the Secretary about the important health care initiatives that this administration is leading. Uh, it's clear that they're shaking things up, um, taking on some entrenched special interests, and making it clear that the status quo in the health care industry um, is no longer acceptable. As leader of an organization, as Joe described, um, we exclusively represent large private sector <coughs> employers uh, that provide health and retirement benefits to workers and families across the country. I can attest that our members are fed up too with the status quo. They want to fix health care and drive improvements through smart purchasing and policy, 
And isn't that all, why we're all here today to hear about from our expert panelists on those topics? In our advocacy on the federal, state, and local level, we work to create an environment so that large employers can design the health benefits that work for their unique workforce. And in the process of that, we're beating back taxes and mandates and compliance burdens so they have the flexibility to do what they need to efficiently provide benefits in communities across the country. Large employers are innovating every day to improve health care and to lower costs. They employ new value-based provider payment models and benefit designs. Despite that they're individually huge companies and that collectively they cover 175 million Americans, apparently that's not enough market share to really move the needle in communities across the country. That's why the federal government needs to join the effort in the value agenda. We're learning about the federal efforts to innovate, and they're promising, but we need to recognize the federal government is 10 to 15 years behind the private sector when it comes to payment innovation and driving the value agenda in the healthcare system. We need to encourage them to move faster. Our expert panelists recognize that employers are concerned about high overall healthcare costs, the lack of transparency, and variability in the practice of care and procedure prices. Shifting the equation so we get better care at lower costs requires the federal government to adopt the practices that have proven to work in the private sector. The Secretary's remarks are a great segue to our two panelists. The first panel will share innovations that are really working in the private sector, and the second will discuss the policy environment needed to really drive improvements and full adoption of the value agenda. Personally, I'd like to set the bar high for the federal programs, as the private sector has really shown the way. The first panel will be moderated by Dr. Paul Ginsburg. As you all know, um, Dr. Ginsburg is the Leonard D. Schaefer Chair in Health Policy Studies at the Brookings Institution and directs the USC Brookings Schaefer Initiative for Health Policy. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Ginsburg for the start of the first panel. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, this panel, is, as uh, Annette Carrasco mentioned, is focusing on developments and payments and delivery that employers private health plans and providers are most enthusiastic about. In organizing this panel, I asked them uh, to focus not on innovations that they may have launched a few years ago and now have an evaluation results, but instead to focus on initiatives that these organizations are most enthusiastic about today and making substantial investments in. And we have four outstanding panelists. I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they'll speak. Uh, first, on my right, is Jeff White, the Director of Healthcare Strategy and Policy at Boeing. And he's going to speak about Boeing's current ACO strategy. Uh, to his right is Roshika Fernandopoul, who is at Iora Health, which is a primary care organization that is contracting with Boeing on its ACO. Uh, then my former colleague, Mai Pham, uh, at Anthem, is responsible for developing and refining Anthem's provider payment models, and she's overseeing their enhanced patient personal care initiative, a program that pays physicians on the basis of value uh, rather than on the basis of volume uh, performance. Uh, finally, Kevin Bozick, who is an orthopedic surgeon and leads the Department of Surgery and Postoperative Care at Dell Medical School at the University of Texas at Austin. He is leading an initiative in bundled payment that is based on conditions rather than surgical procedures. So, Jeff, would you begin? Yes, thank you, Dr. Gingsburg, and thanks for uh, uh, hosting AEI, PBGH, uh, Brookings, and Eric. Um, I think these multi-stakeholder events are, are very powerful. We all we all have a hand to play in the in the healthcare uh, ecosystem and the the mess that. Uh, is what it is today, and uh, we all have a role in uh, figuring out solutions together. So I think these uh, these conversations are very important. So I wanted to provide a very quick summary of how, uh, from the Boeing company, how we view our healthcare strategy, and then dive down into some of the more innovative things that that, that we're doing. Um, and when we look at the you know the healthcare problem today, um, we do a lot of we I guess you could say we have a uh, we deploy a, a portfolio of strategies to kind of combat the the problems that 
exists with the with the healthcare model. Uh, we do a lot of the stuff uh, you know more traditional employers are doing. We strongly believe in in high deductible health plans. We feel employees need to have skin in the game. We believe in uh, our, our wellness programs. It, for for Boeing, it's pretty easy to make those investments because we have long tenured employees and we typically get paid out on those investments. So we're we're very uh, strong in that category. We also uh, strongly believe in uh, providing really good cost and quality uh, data for our employees to make good good decisions. So that's all uh, kind of on the, the demand side of the equation. We, we believe in that and we want uh, uh, that to all succeed. My, my view is that that will do some good for uh, curbing health care costs and improving quality, but it's probably nibbling around the edges if we can't really step into the, the supply side um, issues that exist in the, in the healthcare space. And that's why we've moved to do, uh, doing a, a fair amount of direct contracting with providers. And we feel like that's a, a good opportunity to have a seat at the table and influence uh, the provider community directly. And we're, we're active in three, three primary areas in that space. Um, we, we have a centers of excellence program where we contract directly with uh, various systems, very high, high quality systems around the country. And we're willing to, to ship our employees to those systems. Cleveland Clinic, for example, um, great data on, on, on hearts. Uh, we're happy to ship our folks there. Uh, that's not particularly new for us. We continue to do that and believe that's a good strategy. The, the, the more innovative areas and big areas that we've been working recently is our accountable care organization uh, direct contracts that we've been doing. We've uh, been doing those for a couple of years. We launched in 2015. We have four around the country, uh, Seattle, St. Louis, Charleston, and Southern California. And there's certainly an element of uh, scalability of those, which, which I'll talk about at the end, and that'll lead into what Rashika will talk about with Iora. Uh, but the, the basic premise of these ACOs is uh, we provide a strong incentive uh, for our employees to get their care at these accountable care organizations that pushes revenue and volume uh, to, the, to these integrated health systems. And in re return for that, they guarantee us quality, they guarantee us financial outcomes, um, and improve the member experience. And the, you know, the premise is, is if they're getting their care there, the systems, and if they're getting their care there and they have a long-term incentive, financial incentive, to manage their care better, uh, they will make the investments necessary in their infrastructure to better manage uh, those patients from a clinical standpoint. So um, I'd, I'd say we're, we're very pleased with these, um, w w with, our, with our accountable care organizations so far. Um, you know, the, the, the quality has been definitely improved versus our, our unmanaged po population. Uh, pretty good demonstration of that. I, I, from a financial standpoint, I, I don't want to look at it any one given year. There's still some actuarial noise that happens in these models, um, just because even our population is, is, is large. It's, it's small when it comes down to um, you know, the, 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 the bigger pool that exists um, um, in the healthcare market. So there's a little bit of noise there, but I'd say overall, financially, this has been a, a, a nice win for for the company, it's been a nice win for our employees. I'd, I'd, I'd say it's a nice win for providers. I don't know if they'd all say that, but I, they, we, we, think it, we think it is. Um, so I think it's, a, it's, it's been a, a short and midterm win. But what we're really driving for is, is health healthcare transformation. And we, we want to see the delivery systems change the way they deliver care. And so I'll give you a, one example that we're seeing that we're excited about, and then I'll start talking about our, 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 our scalability. Um, the, uh, b before we did these ACOs, there was virtually zero uh, depression screenings happening at the primary care level. And um, we installed that as one of our um, contract requirements when we set up these ACOs. Uh, we required the primary care docs to start doing uh, depression screenings. And you know, that's a, we recognize that's a tough thing for a primary care doc to do, maybe not something they're uh, necessarily trained in. Same thing with having a conversation about BMI. These are, these are tough conversations. but. What we've recognized over the years is our employees, as everybody would, would imagine, they trust their doctor. They don't uh, necessarily trust the company all the time. They don't trust insurance companies. They don't trust third parties that we're having coach them. They, they trust their doctor. We need to require the primary care doctor and to, to have these, these tough conversations a lot of times and give them the tools to, to be able to do that. So we've seen a very good progression on the number of depression screens that are happening at the primary care level. And all of our ACOs are very active in installing behavioral health clinicians in the primary care setting. And if we think about that from a patient experience, if you, if you go in and you're, uh, if you have some behavioral health issues, to be able to walk down the hall and do a warm transfer is uh, a very effective way. We know there's a ton of access problems in the behavioral health space today. Uh, that, that's, that's hugely important. It's also great for the doc to also have a colleague in the office to be able to go um, 
go connect directly with. So we see that as a, a very good win. I think the, the, the fact that we're holding the, the provider systems accountable is driving some of those decisions about how they're investing in the infrastructure, because I don't know the reimbursement mechanisms were in place uh, to, to, to pay for this previously, so that's why it wasn't, why it wasn't done. The other thing we're, we're working on is having uh, telemedicine approaches to, to behavioral health, where when a patient calls in, they immediately talk to a psychiatrist or a psychologist. They're not talking to a coach or a planner, and they're not uh, waiting four weeks to, to, to talk to a clinician. That can help them directly. So we're, we're uh, investing heavily in this area with, with our ACO partners. We think this is going to be a really big um, win, and we, as we all know, that depression is comorbid with every other, um, every other condition. We had a, an employee who had a dependent that uh, went to the emergency room like 35 times in one year, and it's like, how does that possibly happen and it doesn't take too many of those I mean we think of how dangerous that is for that for that person to be in the emergency room that many times and how expensive that is it's just yeah, there's these people fall through the cracks and um, so we really need to to kind of tackle this behavioral health issue so we're very very pleased that's one you know one kind of narrow example of what I think um, these 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 new conversations and this new driving accountability back to the providers to manage the population are doing. So as we've been thinking about how do we scale this, certainly these are um, bigger negotiations that, that we've done in, in, in areas where we have a, a, a critical mass. Um, we, we would love to bring this value to, to all of our areas, but we do have a problem of scale. I mean, we have look, people in 48 states or 49 states right now. So obviously this, is, this would be tough for us to manage um, so what we're experimenting, experimenting with in, um, in Phoenix, which we're really excited about, and Rashika will talk about the, the details of the program, is uh, with a company called Iora. And they have a really, uh, really effective team-based approach to primary care. Um, and we, at, from Boeing, will just pay them a, a fixed monthly cost. It's free for our, our employees to go get as much uh, primary care as they need. And our feeling is, is this will more than pay for itself as we are able to more effectively manage these sicker populations, reduce inpatient hospitalizations, reduce ER visits. Um, we're, we're, we're pretty bullish on this being a, uh, a, a good play for the company. So, and then I saw, uh, or I heard uh, secretaries are talk about removing government barriers. This is one area where um, our, our strategies aren't always congruent. We want people in high deductible health plans. Uh, this is an area where we can't have someone in, in a high deductible health plan with an HSA also getting uh, direct primary care. So that's something we're working with our, our friends here in DC on, on solving for. I'd love to get that fixed because everybody, we, we, th those strategies should be congruent and uh, we want everybody to be able to get uh, better primary care. So I will uh, end with that. Yeah, thank you. And uh, before we go on to Rashika, I had a question and it's in part anticipation of what my fan might talk about. If you could comment on the importance of the steering of patients to the providers that you prefer to work with uh, in your strategy. Yeah, the, uh, we, we, we've taken a, pr we, we decided to move pretty strongly into the space with a, with a fairly large financial incentive for our employees to take this. So we, we really wanted it to be uh, simple for them to understand. Um, for a family, they save in hard dollar costs about $1,000 a year for moving into an ANO, ACO, electing that as part of their plan. Um, and it's, we have probably 35% uh, enrollment in these ACOs in, in populations where, where they're eligible. So it's gotten a decent amount of movement. It's scaled up every year. So I think it's good. We're getting good word of mouth. Uh, but it's really, from our vantage point, that it's the, the, the incentive that we can provide that will really drive, drive the behavior. Yes, yeah, so this is an enrollment in the ACO rather than a point of service choice? That's right. Okay, yep. thank you. Uh, Rashika, would you like to proceed? Sure, great. So thank you all for, uh, for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you especially for uh, Jeff and Boeing for asking me to come here. So I think if we want to fix health care, in the end, uh, you know, it's pretty simple. We have to change how actual people get actual care. Uh, in some ways, if we don't change how actual people get actual care, it's all a waste of time. Uh, and by the way, there's a lot of waste of time going on, right? And so in the end, we have to change the trajectory of people. We have to improve their health, and we have to keep them out of trouble. Uh, our proposition really is that the right place to start with that is primary care, right? I think um, it's a great lever point. 
it's we can help people with the upstream. We know for a fact that a good part of what determines outcomes has actually nothing to do with medical care. It has to do with how people feel and how they eat and how they exercise and loneliness and particularly with seniors and employed people, a whole lot of other things which are not medical and we can actually help coordinate that in primary care. And then even when we do the best primary care, the people end up having to navigate this whole health system, particularly when they're under high deductible plans and HSAs, they need someone to help them spend their money. Thinking that a consumer can make these decisions by themselves is fooling ourselves. These are really hard choices and there's a lot of dynamics, particularly when you're sick, that you don't want to make this yourself. You need someone trusted to help you do it, and primary care is a great place to do it. The problem is that our current primary care systems are not at all built for this, right? Our health system is built on this transactional model, document, code, bill, next. And the games are all about doing more stuff to people, and that's what all of our health systems, all our IT systems, all of our salary models, all of our processes, everything is built around this transactional thing. Last I checked transactions have never healed anyone, right? The things that heal people are relationships. And what we've been doing is Iora Health, I'm a primary care doc, I started this company about eight years ago. The idea is what if we build a vision of what care ought to be? And let's stop making excuses why we can't do it. And let's only do it. Let's not try to, I think, unfortunately, a lot of the ACOs that Boeing works with are existing health systems who are largely seeing fee-for-service churn the crank. And what Boeing asked him to do is for these subset of your patients who happen to be Boeing members, I want you to treat them differently. And they all say they will. And the honest answer, to be quite honest, is, again, go back to the does actual care change for actual people? It's not entirely clear they really can or want to change, right? So we said, what if we start over? What if we build a new system built on primary care, bottom up, change how people get care, uh, and simply do the right thing? Um, Now, why are payers important? the, The base of this has to be a different business model. Right. If we get paid the same way, everyone else gets paid fee for service, pay per sick visit, uh, perseverate over the 99214 versus 99213, we'll never make progress. Fee for service is the wrong way to pay for this. And there's a period at the end of that sentence. Uh, and so what we say, we need payers who are willing to be progressive. So a Boeing is one of our first. Uh, customers about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, now we recently have started working with them again in, uh, in Mesa and Arizona, where they give us a fixed amount to take care of the patients. Uh, direct primary care is the moniker that's being used for that. Uh, and by the way, we're doubling down on the primary care. Primary care is typically 5% of healthcare spending. That means 95% of what we spend in the U.S. is what I call failure of primary care. That seems like a really stupid investment philosophy. So let's actually double down on the primary care, actually take care of these folks, and we'll see the savings on the back end, right? Um, So need to get paid differently. And I think we've seen the private industry, particularly self-insured employers, um, they can... They have been able to support this. We serve a number of self insured employers like Boeing, uh, Dartmouth College employees. We've worked with people like Zappos, <laughs> unions like the Carpenters Union in Boston, state employees in Massachusetts. And by the way, the people who are driving this are people like Boeing uh, who are uh, large, geographically concentrated, uh, and have long term workforces, right? Because the dirty little secret of all this is if you want to do what we, I call what we do, um, high impact relationship based care that you don't see the results in two months, right? We're building relationships, we're changing behaviors, we're changing biology that doesn't happen in even a year. We may actually make costs go up the first year. It's exactly the right thing to do. So we need people who are, these patients are gonna be their problem for uh, at least two or three years, and that makes sense. So, so number one is you have to change the business model. You know, number two is then you completely redesign a system of care around what we're trying to do. And our job is not see more patients, is not build higher. Our job is very simple. We have a population of people. We know exactly who they are. And our job is improve their health, keep them out of trouble, and this last piece is key, and do whatever it takes. Right? So what does that mean? So now we, we say we're building big teams around patients, not just about doctors. Right. What I can do with a doc is I diagnose and prescribe. That's the easy part. The hard part for patients, and by the way, the bulk of the problem is chronic disease. That's what we do really poorly in this country. That's what's driving all the costs. And I think the hard part is how do you help patients execute on the plan? So we have these people we call health coaches. They're from the community, speak the language of the people they serve. They're picked for empathy. Connecting to another human being, three of them per doctor. And their job is help patients understand what they're doing, track what they're doing, you know, hold their hands when that's the right thing to do, kick them in the behind when that's the right thing to do. Uh, we integrate mental health into the model, so we have, uh, you know, and we're not doing it because anyone's telling us to do it. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> it's really simple. If you have to force people to do the right thing, you have to ask if they're the right partners, right? So we say we're going to 
put it in because the right thing to do. Uh, mental health is such a big barrier. Put social work in practices. Uh, interact with people not just by visits, but email and text message and video chat. Reach out to them. Teach them how to teach them how to eat. Take them to the grocery store. Um, put them together in groups. Help them navigate the system. Build a de facto narrow network uh, beyond us. It's not a little different. It's completely different. We've had to build a new IT platform. All these electronic health records out there, by the way, are not built for this. They're built to document code and bill higher. No surprise, so we've had to build our own. Uh, and it really is a very different culture. Um, we're trying to scale this. We're doing this in 24 different uh, practices around the country. We're doing it uh, in eight different markets. Uh, the hard thing about healthcare is it's not like uh, scaling Starbucks, where you can just put the same thing. You know, Starbucks is Starbucks, but I think healthcare is local. So what we do in Mesa, Arizona, is actually very different than what we're doing in Seattle, for instance, because they're very different populations and expect different things. And by the way, it works, right? We've had lots of experience. Patients love it. We have net promoter scores in the 90% range. Knock it out of the park on quality metrics. And by the way, most of the quality metrics we're tracking are the wrong metrics. Um, so we can do that, but we actually track better ones like self-efficacy and confidence and uh, things that we think actually matter in terms of relationship. You know, and we're driving it on healthcare costs by about 20%, 2-0, largely based on big drops in hospital hospitalizations. Um, so why is this not getting bigger? Why are not more people doing it? I think really two big reasons. One is uh, most payers don't have the guts to do this. And I think Boeing is great that they are willing to actually catalyze this. And by the way, if it's not clear, we're a new entrant, right? So I think thinking that we can solve healthcare by only working with the current people who are making a ton of money off the system is fooling ourselves, right? No industry has changed because the incumbents just woke up and decided to be better. Uh, we can change by people like us, new entrants coming in and, and challenging the status quo a bit. We're not making money off of fitting, filling hospital beds. So I think having payers with the guts to actually catalyze new entrants, that's key. Uh, by the way, CMS, um, in its wisdom, is not able to do this. Despite all the rhetoric about APM's advanced payment models, every one of their advanced payment models are built on a fee-for-service chassis. They're all fee-for-service with some true up at the end. If you want to do an advanced payment model, stop the fee-for-service and let us do it. Now, I think they've got a, an RFI that just came out that seems to indicate they're going in that direction, which we are hugely applauding, right? But I think number one is we need sponsors, payers willing willing to go out on a limb a bit and try new things. Uh, and then number two is I think there are a bunch of regulatory barriers out there. Uh, the HSA rules that um, Jeff mentioned are one of the big problems. I think the way we do a lot of regulation, a lot of the Medicare regulations, I think as uh, Secretary Azar said, are built for an old world and we need to, need to update them to allow us to be able to navigate patients through the system better. Uh, meaningful use, I think some of the NCQA regs are all, again, built for the old system. We need to rethink a lot of them. Um, I think there's a vision of how we do things better. Uh, it really works. Patients love it. We can, by the way, docs love it too. And I think having payers like Boeing who are self-insured who can break the rules and can encourage it will actually move things forward. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Rashik, I've got one question for you. Uh, I was thinking about, you mentioned in various parts of the country you have practices that you're working with. Uh, to what extent uh, the success require that they be completely in your model, or can your model work at si alongside their other patients in traditional fee-for-service? Yes, yeah, so we have made the choice that we will, in our practices, only do this model. I actually think that the sort of care we're, developed, we're doing, this high relationship-based care, it's not a little different than the old system. It's completely different, and that is impossible to do both in the same place. So again, every other business has figured out, figure out what you're good at and do it, and don't try to do other stuff, right? And I think this is really, really hard for existing providers to get over, right? That maybe this is a different model and maybe we need to do it in a different place. We, we firmly believe that we need to do it separately. Good. Thank you. <coughs> Let's turn to my fam. Sure, thanks, Paul. So um, hopefully you'll notice some themes starting to emerge um, as number three starts to talk. I think when, when I think about some of the new things that Anthem is investing in in the value-based payment space, um, you know, we, we tried to start by scoping out initially and having a conversation about our realistic understanding of market momentum and the broader narrative going on in the market. And from what, what that allowed us to do was to try to draw lessons learned from the previous five, 10 years of payment experimentation in the industry broadly, public and private sector. So let me tell you a little bit about that and then drive straight to what the implications are for what we're doing. 
um, you know, from, from my perspective, the broad narrative is that early on there was a lot of excitement around investing in value-based payment and, and care delivery reform, and the mantra was, let's generate momentum, and let's not leave any provider behind. So that was an important thing, and I think we've learned that, frankly, not every provider is built for this kind of work, nor is every provider equally committed to this kind of work. Um, so one lesson learned may be, maybe it's time to leave some providers behind. I think another uh, thing that we experienced was that we dr tried to drive providers to continually wring savings out of the system based on their own historical performance. That is a death spiral that is not sustainable. And what you risk if you keep pursuing that strategy is that your most committed, forward-thinking, first adopter providers will be the first ones to hit the ground. And you will be pushing them over a financial cliff. And once they disengage, what you lose is everyone behind them because they are looking, their peers, their less experienced peers are looking to see what the risk takers experience. So that's another cautionary tale is, gee, we really need to find a way to build a sustainable business case for the most committed providers, the highest value providers, if you will. We really need to invest in them. Another thing we learned, uh, it was completely understandable that we begin by layering as much accountability on primary care as possible. I am a primary care doc. I, I, this, is, this is my heart and soul, and Anthem has invested big time in primary care. We are the largest private sector participant in CPC+. We have uh, an essentials program that will capture 400,000 lives by the end of this year. We're a big investor, but there's only so much I can ask my ASO clients to give me to invest in primary care without taking it from somewhere else. And it was perhaps not realistic to expect the providers with the least market leverage to somehow corral the entire rest of the delivery system without payers actively stepping in and engaging those other payers much more forcefully. So that's another lesson learned. And then I think, you know, on a, on a sort of more micro level, um, we are asking many providers, not Rashika's ilk because he truly is a disruptor and uh, a, a new entrant, but for many incumbents who want to move in this direction and they still provide the bulk of the care in this country, you are asking them to put one foot in one canoe and one foot in another canoe, and that is the most uncomfortable place to be. I have had providers come up to me, particularly specialists involved in bundle payments, can you move faster? Can you just get us there right now because we're dying in these two canoes? Well, the reality is payers are living in the two canoes too. So how do we move people from two canoes to one canoe as quickly as possible? Payers have to move with providers in that journey. And that means that the things that are making the first fee-for-service pay-for-volume canoe uncomfortable for everyone, they should also disappear on the payer side as well as the provider side as we move to this new world. So let me translate that. There are administrative burdens like coding and prior auth for this world that make perfect sense in this first world, that make no sense in the second world. And payers have to be willing to shift our behavior as we ask providers to shift their behavior. And then, uh, and you know, you could put quality measurement into that bucket. Thank you, Rashika, for bringing that up because we firmly believe that the current performance measurement system is, has become sclerotic, and it does not focus on the things that are meaningful to patients or to purchasers, meaning true care outcomes as opposed to process. And it shouldn't be a slew of metrics to show us that you can jump through hoops. It should be enough to reassure us that you're not generating savings um, by stinting on necessary care or not not enhancing care the way that we would like. So there's a lot of evolution that can happen there. And the lesson there is focus on outcomes, slim down the metrics, and if someone is at downside risk, that's all you should need, right? Because you have entrusted them with the accountability for those outcomes. And then the last lesson learned, I would say, is, is a really big one, and it's an elephant in the room. Um, and, and I think that it's, it's necessary when we talk about this to deconflate several issues. So let me explain. There are structural barriers that will, if they are, remain unaddressed, forever limit what can be achieved with value-based payment and care delivery reform. One of those is the structure of relative prices in fee-for-service. We all agree that 
all things being equal, it would be better to not pay on a fee-for-service basis and to pay on a lump sum or global cap sum kind of basis. But to be honest, there are some services that you wouldn't want to pay any other way except fee-for-service, right? And fee-for-service, the, the prices are there with us regardless of the cash flow mechanism. So while Rashika would do better with a global payment, the prices that are embedded in that global payment are based on a fee schedule that has become grossly distorted in terms of the relative prices. So Rashika still has to somehow account for the fact that certain procedures cost unholy amounts of money and yet are not tied to proportionate clinical value. Whereas other services that are, we believe, based on data linked to high value are not paid at all or not paid for very much. So they're pricing distortions. That's a big structural problem. Uh, another big structural problem are the social factors that drive health outcomes. And very few value-based payment programs have addressed that. And I would put into the third bucket, again, in total agreement with Rishika, that the third set of structural issues is our assumption of what is necessary in the care delivery system to make care work. Why are bricks and mortar necessary? Truly, are they necessary in all the circumstances where we currently use them now? It's an issue of the input costs, really, being sacred cows for some reason. So if we were willing to tackle all of those things and acknowledge the lessons learned all in one package, I could retire. Uh, and so that's, that's the attempt that Anthem is embarking on, is how do we rope all these things together and create it in a co-design effort with some of our key customers and some of our key providers, because frankly, there are many trade-offs required to bring together all of these elements that you can't make in a black box or playing whisper down the lane with a plan, right, translating between a payer and a provider. So we have everyone in the room talking about these very challenging issues. And that's the program that we hope to stand up is a national high value network strategy that is rides on an ACO chassis but engages specialists much more deeply, not just through bundled payments, but through, frankly, new reimbursement opportunities. One of the things we want to do with, these, with this program is to affirmatively, assertively say, we don't want to buy what is currently available in the care delivery system. We would like to decide what we'd like the care delivery system to offer and have everybody catch up. Would that be OK with you? And so we will actually have explicit requirements for providers who want to be in this narrow network to address what we think is core, which is not just clinical outcomes, but member experience in a quantitative way. So it will be, to our knowledge, the first time that a commercial payer will be holding providers accountable quantitatively for member experience linked directly to their financial opportunity. Um, and to actually try to guarantee that enhanced member experience based on the capabilities we expect the provider to have or have walking in the door or to rapidly build up. Things like digital access. Things like if we turn on a, a pricing for an e-consult code, you need to actually use it because that could mean that a patient doesn't have to take that one extra day off from work to go sit in a specialist's office for a five minute conversation that could have been settled by email. Um, so a whole list of provider requirements like that, including things like, we'd like you to show us your compensation structure for your frontline docs. We won't dictate it, but we'd like to see how well you're transmitting the incentives downwards, right? But in exchange for that, for those requirements, meeting those requirements, providers get a narrow network or tiered with steep differentials for cost sharing. They get required PCP selection, because we have learned in our match control evaluation of our own ACO program that when a patient remains with the same PCP year on year, the savings are doubled relative to when that doesn't happen. And they get, um, they, they go to downside risk, and they're much more confident about it because we relieve them of the prior auth requirements, which by the way, was costing us money, <laughs> and which we were approving at a, an extremely high rate anyway, um, why would we bother them with that if they're at downside risk and they have this linkage and they have every incentive in the world to avoid that first dollar of loss? So we try to think of this certainly not as the perfect solution, but as a vehicle 
right, for having that conversation. Hey, let's start with what we think care delivery should look like. Then what are the pieces that we need, all of us stakeholders, to bring to the table? What skin in the game will we put in to make that work? And it will include, for example, provider, employers who don't use Anthem as their PBM to share your PBM data. Why? Because Rashika's uh, type can't do anything about care management if they don't see the data. And we can't hold them accountable for cost of care if we don't see the data. Um, it's a vehicle for having that conversation because version 2.0 might look different as care ideals evolve. Version 2.0 may tackle social determinants. Version 3.0 may tackle a virtual care delivery network that doesn't involve any bricks and mortar at all, except in the patient's home or in their workplace. Imagine that. We're obviously not there yet, but the notion is to set that set of expectations and the interdependencies and get that working relationship going. Well, thank you, Mike. You answered my questions. <laughs> so let's, let's move on oh, to working Kevin. Working for you Bozek. for eight years would help with that. <laughs> Thanks, Paul, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. As, as a, an orthopedic surgeon, I represent the specialist view on this panel, and I've had the opportunity over the last 12 years in a variety of different leadership roles for the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons to work with Bill Kramer and PBGH and Paul Ginsburg and Pat Conway when he was at CMMI and others. And I'd like to think that that's because as orthopedic surgeons, we're highly intelligent and uniquely qualified to address some of the challenges, but I have a feeling it has more to do with the fact that we do a lot of really expensive procedures uh, and people are having trouble getting their arms around how do we control both the cost and the volume of those procedures. And so it's been interesting for me, having lived in this space for a while, that we've, we've, we've kind of focused on this shift from fee-for-service uh, to capitation. And really, we know that in fee-for-service, we incentivize over-utilization. And in the primary care world, as we've shifted to capitation, we've addressed some of those perverse incentives, but we still continue to pay specialists through fee-for-service predominantly, and whether that's through uh, a bundle payment or just a, a traditional fee-for-service mechanism. And so I've had the opportunity to be involved in the development of a variety of different bundle payment programs. We started our first bundle payment uh, when I was at UCSF uh, through the Integrated Healthcare Association in 2008, and we got a grant from HRQ. It was a three-year grant to launch a bundle payment for hip and knee replacement. At the end of three years and $750,000 of HRQ's money, we enrolled exactly one patient after three years in that bundle. Uh, we published our experience in health affairs, and we learned a lot from that. Uh, and that informed some of the dialogue around the BPCI program. And when the BPCI program was launched, 80% of the uh, hospitals that participated in BPCI had uh, orthopedics in there amongst the DRGs that were included. We, we were one of the pioneer uh, BPCI programs in, in 2011 in Model 4 and learned a lot of lessons from that and then shifted to Model 2. We then became uh, the first mandatory bundle payment uh, under the Medicare program through the, the CGR program in 2016. And so we have about a decade worth of experience now of, uh, around bundle payments for procedures. And Essentially what we've learned from that is that the, uh, the payment model and changes in the payment model drive changes in the delivery model, right? And so that prior to the introduction of bundle payments, we, as an orthopedic surgeon, I would do my procedures in a facility. My patients would get a variety of different post-acute care in a variety of different places. I never communicated with those people. They never communicated back to me. And by incentivizing us across that care continuum, we were forced to start communicating with each other and understand where the value was added to patients. We eliminated a lot of non-value added post-acute care. And essentially to summarize, after, after a decade, we reduced the length of stay somewhat for these procedures. Uh, we reduced the utilization of post-acute care. And so overall costs decreased slightly with no detrimental impact on outcomes, which as a physician was not very inspirational to me. I didn't understand how that was helping me improve the health of my patients or improve the value of care that we deliver to our patients. And so I could sum up my experience with the, with the Medicare uh, bundle payment program and total joint replacement by a patient who I saw last month. Uh, it was a 68-year-old woman who I saw who had a bundle payment, had a knee replacement done uh, through the BPCI program, a Medicare bundle payment, uh, 18 months prior, and had a perfect bundle by the Medicare definition. She was in the hospital for one night, was discharged directly home with no post-acute care, 
was not readmitted to the hospital and had no complications within 90 days, came to see me 18 months later and was absolutely miserable. So does anybody want to guess why? So knee replacement wasn't the right procedure for that patient. It wasn't the right treatment for that patient. So when we bundle at the procedure level, we get exactly what the system uh, motivates us to do, which is we get more procedures whether or not those procedures are appropriate or not. After 18 months, no one had ever measured that patient's pain, functional status, quality of life, or mental health. No one had ever done that until she presented uh, to our practice. And every single patient that we see with joint pain, the first thing we do is measure, use validated measures of pain, functional status, quality of life, and mental health to determine what's the most appropriate treatment for that patient. That patient had a knee replacement for untreated anxiety and depression, unfortunately. A knee replacement, as effective as it is, is not a good treatment for anxiety and depression. And so what we've learned from this is we need to move upstream from bundling at the procedure level to bundling at the condition level, which is what we're now doing in Austin. We have a bundle payment for the management of hip and knee arthritis. So what does that do? Just as the bundle payment at the procedure level incentivizes us to change our behavior and coordinate care between acute and post-acute providers, now we have been forced to coordinate care across the spectrum of people who manage arthritis. What does that mean? We have mental health providers on our team. About a third of the patients that we see for hip and knee pain screen positive for anxiety and depression. That needs to be managed and treated way before we even think about that patient undergoing a major surgical procedure that could have significant implications for their quality of life. So we have behavioral health trained social workers on our team. We have a nutritionist. Many of our patients uh, have, have lifestyle issues that need to be addressed before we would I I ever think about any type of surgical procedure. We have physical therapists, chiropractor, <laughs> acupuncture, uh, and advanced practice nurses. The least important person on that team in, in terms of you know, the, the person who interacts the least with those patients is an orthopedic surgeon, right? So I've never understood why somebody wakes up with knee pain, they go to see an orthopedic surgeon, right? So if I wake up with a headache, I don't go see a neurosurgeon, right? <laughs> but if I, if I have knee pain or shoulder pain, I would think nothing about my primary care doctor referring me to an orthopedic surgeon. It makes no sense to me. And so I am, I am the least important person on that team. And yes, about 10 to 15% of those patients are appropriate to see an orthopedic surgeon, but 85% are not. And so what have we learned over 18 months with this bundle? We've significantly reduced the, the per capita cost for managing those patients, and not by, just by ordering fewer MRI scans and injections and doing things that don't work. We've reduced the number of surgeries by 25% across the population that we treated, but we've added cognitive behavioral therapy. We've added nutritional services and other services for those patients that improve their overall health. And most importantly, we're measuring the things that matter to those patients, which is pain, functional status, quality of life, and their overall mental health. And so what have we learned from this experience? We've learned, again, that the payment model, changes in the payment model drive changes in the delivery system, that bundle payments incentivize greater uh, coordination and communication across providers, but bundling at the procedure level limits value creation by ignoring the concept of appropriateness that bundling at the condition level drives value by incentivizing greater coordination and communication across all of the providers that manage people with chronic pain, which is not just orthopedic surgeons in my case. It forces us to measure uh, outcomes that matter to patients and to use those outcomes in true shared decision-making conversations with patients. So again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and I look forward to the discussion. Oh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, just one question. Uh, you have any thoughts about what the the trajectory might be to getting these ideas about condition-specific bundle payments uh, more widely used? Well, you know, what we've learned, and to Mai's comments, that this is something that's, it's, if, if it's challenging for a payer to bundle at the procedure level, it's even more challenging to bundle at the condition level. So there's a lot of structural problems that we've had to work through in our market. We're doing this on a pilot with, we, we first started with our county health district, and that's been a very successful pilot. We now have it uh, with two employers and one uh, regional payer in our market. And there's a lot of uh, changes that need to be made to claims adjudication. And also benefit design matters a lot, right? So if I have a patient that's treated in this model and decides, well, the doctor down the street, 
I know operates on everybody that walks through the door. That's where I'm going to go to get my care. It, it, it's it's going to blow up the model. Fortunately, our experience so far has been that once patients are treated in this model and they understand all of the incentive, all of the different services that they can access, telehealth, access to cognitive behavioral therapy, nutrition, physical therapy, other things. To our knowledge, we haven't had a single patient that's left the model yet, but the benefit design and steerage matters in that type of model. Thank you. Well, it really sounds to me like there's a lot of alignment among uh, uh, the presentations of the four panelists. Uh, before we go to the audience, I'd like to ask if any of the panelists have any reactions, comments they would want to make about what some of the others have said. Yeah, I I'd like to, first of all, reinforce that Anthem is also moving to what we refer to them as chronic episodes as opposed to acute episodes, but very similar concept. And uh, and we're focused on certain high-priority specialties, um, but I think they would look very familiar to you. So um, that's also in the works. And, and to Rashika's points, I guess I would also say that I think it's important for payers to actively invest in disruptive care delivery models. Um, because the disruption is very inspiring, uh, but it, it runs into a lot of brick walls in the marketplace, and someone needs to clear the path for these for these non incumbents um, to make their way in. So I would just I would just put that on the table too that there are you know certain smart bets that I think if payers as a group made investments in, we could speed up this care evolution by quite a bit. So, so I, I love this panel and obviously agree with what people say. I think, uh, I think too often value-based care is used as an end in and of itself, and I think that's a red herring. The real, the real thing is how do we allow patients to meet their needs, right? So really it's consumerism. And by the way, one of the needs consumers have, they want to get this at the highest quality, consistent with a great experience, and at the lowest cost because I'm spending increasingly my own money. Right, so I think uh, we need to make sure we don't try to re replicate the managed care of the 80s where we force people to do things and we sort of save money by under-treating. We have to, I think, if we want to be successful. And I think there all these are examples of just aligning everything with the right thing for the consumer slash patient, and then this will all work out. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that um, to Rashika's point, I think what's really missing here is measuring outcomes that matter to patients. So when we focus, when we talk about quality measurement, the things that we're measuring now, right now around process and structure just aren't that relevant to my patients. And we really need to work together to, it, it really starts with what we've learned in our experience, it starts with measuring what matters to the patient, identifying what their goals are, and then helping them move towards those goals. And the, and the current way that we're, we're doing that and, and, and measuring quality just hasn't moved us in that direction. I just want to point out on that point, I couldn't agree with you more, um, Kevin, but <laughs> what we find is that the way a provider speaks about that really tells you a lot about their commitment to value-based care because many of your colleagues would not voice that. Many of them would much rather prioritize the alignment of performance metrics for totally valid reasons, administrative burden, et cetera. But they would rather have an aligned set of metrics that focused on less <coughs> meaningful process measures than they would to strike out and do the harder thing. It's very resource intensive to collect that, out, that type of outcomes data. And even when payers are willing to do it, it the burden on providers can be, you know, dispositive at times. Um, so when, when, we, when we talk about focusing on high-value providers, in our heads, there are archetypes of providers along this spectrum of commitment. And we, we, need, we find that we need to tailor our contracting strategy and reimbursement strategy to those archetypes. And there aren't, you know, there's only one or two archetypes at this end of commitment. Yeah, and I, I hear that a lot from providers, exactly what you just said, which is it's really expensive to measure outcomes, particularly in our case, patient reported outcomes, right? So we do, we do about a million hip and knee replacement procedures in, these, in, in the United States every year. The only reason we do that procedure is to influence pain, function, quality of life. Less than 1% of time do we measure that. And so the reason is because that's not where the incentives are, right? So 
I think nothing, I saw, we saw 40 patients in my practice yesterday. We think nothing of the 10 to 15 minutes we spent on every patient trying to find the appropriate ICD-10 code and match that up with the appropriate uh, CPT code and figure out all the modifiers. That's just the cost of doing business. There's a lot, and, and our revenue cycle management software is the most expensive part of our practice. And we just assume that that's the cost of doing business. That's because that's the way we're paid. When we start to be paid based on outcomes, Measuring outcomes becomes my business intelligence. I have to know how I'm doing in terms of outcomes because that's going to influ influence my financial performance. So as the system changes and in our bundle payment strategy, we have to be able to measure outcomes at the condition level. Otherwise, we, we, there's no way for us to compete and understand how, the, the, the quality of the outcome that we're providing to that patient and that payer. So the, really this, this concept that yes, it's expensive, of course it's expensive, so is revenue cycle management and adds no value to the patients that I treat. <laughs> Measuring patient reported outcomes adds tremendous value both in terms of determining what treatment's appropriate and how we're doing and that is now our new business intelligence. I'd say one, one barrier to one of my comments about uh, employers and payers need to invest in this area. It, a lot of times we tend to think only on what is the ROI strictly in terms of the, you know, what is my rate going to be next year? What is the, the, the financial return on investment? Uh, when my mentioned e-consult, if, if I think about my my workforce and someone in, in, our, in our Everett facility takes someone 30 minutes or 40 minutes to go from the production line out to their car. <laughs> and so if, if, we're, if we're saving somebody a visit to the specialist, that is huge for our business. So my hope is that... Uh, companies, whether they're production-based or not, can open the aperture a little bit in terms of thinking about return on investment and these more disruptive ideas because a lot of that the stuff we're doing is hugely important to just running our business. Um, so I, I, I hope we, we think more about uh, uh, ex expanding our view of, of investments in this area as well. Yeah, well, thank you. I think it's a good time to turn to the audience. Yeah, and uh, there's a mic right behind you. And could you identify yourself? Sure. Uh, Ann Griner with the Patient Center and Primary Care Collaborative. Uh, great set of presentations and a lot of wonderful ideas. Um, Rashika, you mentioned that um, relationships heal people, not transactions. And mine noted that if you stay with the same PCP, you actually double your savings. Um, we're in a world where um, patients are getting their care in all different kinds of settings, from all different kinds of prep. Uh, providers through different modalities. So how do you preserve that relationship? You, um, so, you know, I think you pull out every tool in your toolkit. So I think of my job, you know, my title has something to do with payment innovations, but really it's about rationalizing how you link payment to product and benefit <laughs> design, how you think about the member experience, how you educate both customers and their members about the value of primary care functions. Um, we are okay with being agnostic about who should perform those functions, but those functions have reams and reams of literature behind them to cement our belief that they are incredibly valuable for the performance of a healthcare system. So that's not just first contact care, which of course, you know, you can get on your doorstep or you can get at a pharmacy or you can get in a, in a doctor's office, but it's much more than that. It's the continuity, it's the coordination. Um, and so I think it's kind of going back to basics and building the product and benefit structures to support that. Um, you know, we, we would, as we require PCP selection, we're gonna try to make that as smart as possible and tr to, try to try to entice patients in, not just with the stick of cost sharing, but with positive reasons for why you would want this. Um, so, you know, it may not be as wonky as evaluation data, but it may be, hey, this PCP can offer you a patient navigator program. They can take your email. You can schedule online. You know, there are, there are things to, you have at our disposal if you're willing to be a little bit humble and think outside of your box um, to make patients stickier, and then you back that up with the cost sharing to signal the broader set of values that, you know, that the customer has or, or that we are trying to promote. So I think in general what we need to do is uh, 
redesign almost everything we do in care delivery around the patient, right? We design around ourselves, cardiology department, the echo department. I think the way you're bundling is exactly, you know, is going in the right direction. As if we if we just rethink how we deliver everything, not at a, you know, not at a what happened gets paid for, but around the need of the patient, then all of a sudden it gets much easier to integrate these things. Good up, Gail. The amount of agreement is actually very encouraging uh, given the different perspectives and, and background that you bring. Are there legal impediments now uh, that you are experiencing uh, either as a physician providing service uh, or as a private payer anthem or uh, in either of your other's uh, uh, experiences that um, might facilitate the adoption of um, measures and focus that include what patients hold uh, important? Oh my, so I I have a whole shopping list, but I'll try to but limit it'd be myself. Really, it'd be very helpful yeah. to begin to get those sure. known because those either, at, well, particularly if it's state or federal, yeah. uh, where the uh, barriers exist, uh, given the uh, wide alignment of views that we've heard this morning. So uh, in no particular order, I will start with sharing of substance abuse treatment data and the CFR part two provider provisions in the current regulations and statute um, that we believe are outdated and that actively get in the way of our behavioral health providers, our PCPs, or the rest of our network actually doing what they need to for patients. Um, I would also put up there, there are specific state laws that actually make it easier rather than harder to take anti-tiering, anti-steering language out of provider contracts, um, which I think undermines a lot of what purchasers are trying to accomplish um, and, and gives disproportionate power to already powerful providers um, in certain markets. Yeah, I, I would say I would agree with data sharing being at the top of the list as a provider who's trying to innovate and develop new models for both payment and, and care delivery. Having access to the data around around utilization and outcomes is extremely challenging and makes trying to predict uh, or, or even understand what existing utilization is challenging. The other is, and I would say organized medicine has been the biggest uh, uh, proponent of this, is limitations on, on scope of practice. So I think that that as you develop care models, you want everyone functioning at the top of their license, what Clayton Christensen calls downstreaming care. So we want, in our practice, we want nurse practitioners doing what physicians used to do and medical assistants doing what nurse practitioners did and on down the line. And, and there are a lot of challenges at, at the individual state level around scope of practice that limit that. For instance, I, I believe a pharmacist is much better qualified than I am uh, to prescribe medications to my patients. They know a lot more about drug interactions than I do, and they have a lot better understanding of what's going on in the pharmacology of that patient's life. But we have challenges getting our, our pharmacists prescribing uh, privileges. So th there are a lot of scope of practice issues that limit us. And we have a whole laundry list, too, of things that get in the way. And again, not surprisingly, these regulations were written uh, either with the current system in mind or, to be honest, to protect the incumbents. Uh, yeah, I mean, so some of the Stark and referral issues are a big problem. Again, we don't want to own all the downstream. We think that these humongous owned entities are not necessarily good, at least not the only answer, but then we're, it's hard for us sometimes to create relationships because of um, some of the Stark things. I think that the steerage, this idea that all doctors are equal and somehow you can't uh, let people know that some are different or better than others, and that they're, a plan... They're equal even though they charge 30% more than yeah. some others. <laughs> right, so I think some of those sort of steerage rules are a thing. Something we'd love to do is actually share some of the savings with our patients, you know, which I think we're really not able to do. We're generating huge surpluses that the plan takes a huge amount, and we get to have some, but why shouldn't the patient share in that? And can we find ways to, to do that in ways that don't violate sort of the Medicare rules? Um, data sharing is a huge issue, this sort of secret pricing. It is unclear why we allow people to, you know, we try and figure out pricing so we can navigate it, and they say, well, prices are secret. Anthem's told us that before, well, I, and that's so just unacceptable. To be fair, we just rolled out data, <laughs> price transparency and claims data for our ACOs yeah. started mm -hmm. January. So. Yeah, no, no, so I think this, this secret data stuff, this secret, yeah. secret pricing stuff just ought to be illegal, particularly when patients have to pay it, right? It seems pretty simple, but there's a whole laundry list of things we need to fix. 
Good. So someone on this side for a question? Yes. Oh, J Jeff, want to hold for the oh, mic? Sorry. Jeff Selberg, Peterson Center on uh, Healthcare. Rashika, your model is something we've researched at the center. We're very, very supportive. My question is about scaling. I think you mentioned 24 practices in eight markets. Last estimate, I think there are 40,000 primary care practices across the country. Is this a greenfield project in terms of it has to be a new practice that you start? or can existing practices be transformed? And what's your strategy about that? Yeah, so I think that I, we, so we, we, obviously we eventually need to do the second part, right? So we obviously aren't going to replace every practice with a from scratch practice. I happen to think that for now, the thing that needs to happen is we need to create a vision of what this future is. And the easiest way to create the vision is to just do it. Um, the next order is how do we get practices to move? The key problem there is to get most of the payers to move, right? So the big struggle if you're an existing practice is if only the Boeing company is willing to contract differently and only 10% of your patients are Boeing patients. We tried this in Seattle with Boeing where we worked with Virginia Mason and Boeing was willing to do something different with a case rate, and, uh, but they were 10% of the practice's patients. It's really hard to get a practice. Now, if you could get Medicare plus Medicaid plus Boeing mm -hmm. plus some of the bigger plans and you can get, the, the, tip, the tipping point isn't 100, but it's not 20, right? Uh, I think it's probably 60 or 70%. All of a sudden now you can make it happen. So I think that's the key is to get sort of consensus among payers that we're moving in this direction. Yes, sir. I'm Dan Weber from AMAC Association of Mature American Citizens. Uh, Jeff, uh, you have a unique situation. You're in favor of HSAs, direct primary care, and high deductible. And as you know, that's against the law now. So two <laughs> questions. What needs, to be, <laughs> what needs to be done to change that? And the second thing is, did you get an exemption from uh, Obamacare? to do what you folks are doing? Um, so we don't have any exemption to do what we're doing. What, what we do with, with uh, Iora is people enroll in their uh, health plan. They can go over to Iora and, and get free primary care with them as long as they're not in the high deductible health plan. So we need to, we need to get a, a fix for that. Um, yeah. And I think there's some, some bills floating ar around that would do right. that. But yeah, we, we would very much like that to happen because 30, 40% of our of our population is in the high deductible health plan, so they're excluded from being able to use this better primary care yeah. approach that we'd like to uh, push people to. So, yes. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. No, we have a lot of people online. Hi, I'm Teresa O'Keefe with Armada Care, and I'm most interested in quality transparency. I think a lot of people wouldn't have jobs in this room, including myself, if it was pure quality transparency. And I wanted to know, between uh, Jeff and the providers, are, are you as providers willing to open the kimono and work with employers in direct contracting in redefine, starting to redefine quality? And what kind of conversations <laughs> are you having with that that's not already published? Thank you. I can, I can start and just say that absolutely that's the key to, I mean, as a provider, it, there's nothing more motivational than being able to improve someone's health and quality of life. That's what we, you know, that's what gets us out of bed in the morning. But measuring things like administration of antibiotics and, and the, the things that we're measuring right now is just not inspirational. So I think the key to motivating providers is to having those outcomes that matter to patients and then standardizing them so that we're not measuring different things for Anthem and for CMS and for... Uh, for other payers and, and for employers for that matter uh, and then developing some consistency around the infrastructure to do that so groups like ICHOM and others that are trying to get consistency around what matters what should be measured for specific conditions and then there's an industry that's growing up around okay let me facilitate how you can measure that so to my point we're not you know we're not tripping over each other trying to reinvent the wheel and spending a lot of money on infrastructure. So I would say absolutely from the provider's perspective, it's extremely important not only in improving value but for provider satisfaction to be able to measure those things that matter to our patients. So, so uh, one of my favorite quotes is from uh, Michelangelo and they asked him once, how do you get the Pieta, this beautiful sculpture? And he said, it's really simple. I take a block of stone and I chip away everything that's not the Pieta. 
<laughs> right? So I think too often we, we add stuff on and our health system is created and what we need to take things away. It's not hard to actually, and actually we've had conversations with a lot of our sponsors about adding the right measures. The really hard conversation <laughs> is let's get rid of the ones that don't matter, the stuff that's not the pieta. And that's a really hard conversation because they're so fixated on it, despite the fact that everyone can agree they're not... Um, they're not useful. And actually, I think the trade-off for providers, I'm happy to collect this new stuff, but let me stop collecting the other stuff. And people need to be willing to give up on that. Yeah, that's, that's something we hear often from our provider partners is they're, they, they're asked for Boeing to provide certain metrics and the insurance carriers other metrics. I think we can collectively come up with the right what, what the right metrics are, and I think Rashika said it well. It, it, we we need to evolve from some of these more you know leading indicators to um, for for Rashika. Now we have Net Promoter Score as a as a uh, as a as an outcome measure that we're using with him. It, I think that's a good a, a good progression from from kind of leading indicators, kind of NQF measures only to uh, ones that really measure patient satisfaction in a in a new way. So I think we'll see an evolution of that. But I'd like. Um, us to kind of come together and, and all agree on what are the what are the right metrics because we don't want that. this is a burden uh, when when Boeing has a set of standards that's different from carriers that's different than you know other other pairs so we, we need to come together to make that um, more more simple. Yeah, well, each of you have really contributed a great deal of fascinating stuff to this uh, conference, and I want to thank the panel. Hey Jeff, could you hand this to some? Uh, hand it to.
<clears throat> Hello? Ah, okay. All right. So uh, those of you who have managed to last this long, uh, you're, you're to be congratulated uh, and uh, thanks. Uh, and uh, please uh, join us for the uh, second panel. Uh, the uh, f first panel, of course, reflected uh, the enthusiasm and brilliant ideas of the private sector. And of course, this is a panel that's going to say, well, we don't know about that for the government. Um, <clears throat> and there's some truth in it. I, I, uh, Rashika, actually, I thought made a few great comments that fit right in with this panel, such as, uh, uh, well, all you have to do is get Medicare and Medicaid to change the entire operation, and it should be easy to transform the health system. Yeah, that, that wouldn't be bad to do. Or uh, uh, the way he put it, he referred to the PHA, just get rid of what you don't want. Well, yeah, except that uh, as, we, as we all know, those of us who have stuck it out this far, uh, everything is an entitlement in the health sector. It's not just the entitlement to uh, patients or, or beneficiaries in the Medicare and Medicaid programs. It's, it's an entitlement to the providers. It's an entitlement to the insurers. It's an entitlement, by the way, to everybody because, of course, everybody, one way or the other, is getting a subsidy uh, 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 either through the tax system or directly. And, of course, uh, uh, the only lesson you need to know about Washington is you can't ever take anything away from anybody, or at least you can't do it directly. So the, I, think, I think all of our experiences has been that, that uh, Medicare has been successful uh, at... Uh, uh, doing uh, uh, two things at once. One, the most important thing is telling beneficiaries, uh, no, we're not affecting your benefits or anything else about, about your health care. And on the other hand, periodically uh, uh, reducing uh, payment updates, uh, which is just an indirect way, if it actually sticks, it's an indirect way of affecting how health care uh, is delivered. <clears throat> um, similarly, uh, in the Medicare program, uh, uh, you know, we have all these innovative ideas, ACOs, for example. But ACOs, of course, were not invented out there in the real world. They were invented largely in Washington. Uh, and that's, I think, been, been one of the issues with those kinds of innovations. Uh, I would also point to, um, uh, to the bundling uh, projects as well. Uh, uh, you know, why, why have they worked out or not worked out very well? As, the, as has been the case. Well, I think, I think it's partly that the Medicare program in particular is structured in a way, has been structured in a way for a very, very long time that makes it difficult to move. And when you make changes, you are not, not only changing, potentially changing the way healthcare is delivered, but more importantly, you're redistributing money. You may be taking some away, probably not, but you're redistributing it. So there are winners and losers. <clears throat> and uh, the winners uh, are grateful and are quiet, and the losers complain. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, this poses all kinds of challenges and problems. Uh, it's, that isn't to say that private sector proposals can't work. It's, it's to say that it's very, very difficult in an entirely different situation uh, when uh, trying to change government policy. Uh, uh, one other observation, you know, from the first panel that I, I, I wanted to emphasize, and, and uh, one of the early speakers uh, made the observation that <clears throat> uh, his company's uh, innovation uh, was going to work uh, for uh, essentially a large, fairly permanent workforce. <clears throat> now, you might say that the Medicare program, we're not exactly, those who are in the Medicare program aren't workers, but they're permanent. Uh, so you would think that the Medicare program could actually take advantage of these kinds of innovations that have a long-term payout. And yet the Medicare program is locked into the same exact structure that the rest of the health financing system uh, is locked into, which is it's a short-term perspective. It's a one-year perspective. Maybe it's a two-year perspective, but it's not the long-term. Medicare shouldn't have that excuse, but I, I believe that's, that's where we are. Anyway, with those 
words of encouragement. <laughs> let me turn to Gail Waletsky. Gail is, uh, excuse me, uh, actually, let me, let me uh, introduce everybody so I, I, I don't fail to do that. <clears throat> Gail is a senior fellow at Project Hope and uh, uh, was uh, administrator uh, of what is now known as CMS, uh, used to be called HICFA. Uh, uh, then the next speaker will be uh, Mark Miller. Mark Miller uh, was the uh, 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 longest serving executive director of the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. Uh, which um, is, uh, for those of you who uh, may not know everything about it, uh, is an unusual group of, of people or organization because their advisory, but their advice actually has weight and it is based on detailed understanding of the complexities of the Medicare program. And Mark is very much responsible for that. Uh, he has uh, moved on uh, to, uh, let's see, what is your title, Mark? You are Vice President, Vice President, Vice President, uh, Vice President of Healthcare at the Arnold Foundation. Uh, then next, we have Chris Jennings. <coughs> Chris, uh, as I think um, many of you know, has been deeply involved with uh, uh, health reform, uh, uh, at least starting with the uh, Clinton health reform in the 90s, but continuing on for many, many years, has held uh, positions in, in the Congress and White House and other places. Uh, he is uh, uh, now the head of his uh, 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 own uh, consulting firm, the Jennings Policy Strategies uh, Company. And then finally, we have Lon He Chen. <coughs> Excuse me. And Lon He is the uh, David and Diane Steffi Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Uh, and is a uh, frequent uh, uh, interviewee on uh, numerous uh, television programs, news programs, and is on numerous panels. And he lives in California, so we're lucky that he was uh, willing to come this far. Uh, so with that, uh, Gail, please uh, take it away. The general topic we were asked to uh, speak about are um, ways to translate <coughs> Uh, from the private sector uh, into the, uh, the public sector uh, and the kinds of barriers that we see uh, in the way. I think that was uh, ultimately what uh, Joe wanted us to focus on. Um, listening to what was said, uh, augmenting the work I'm already aware of uh, through the Peterson Center and, and others about what is going on in, in the... Uh, uh, private sector and thinking about what they've said um, has helped me to focus on a couple of areas where I believe we need to get agreement first. And it's an area where government may be able to lead, although ultimately who is regarded as the convener may become important uh, uh, because of um, update impediments that get involved. And what I'm, I'm thinking about here uh, is the repeated uh, indication in, in different ways about the importance of measuring what matters to patients. And that uh, I uh, have been overwhelmed recently by the proliferation of metrics that are now in use uh, when you consider uh, all of the demands and requirements uh, that come out of uh, CMS uh, and the government with regard to uh, measures they want, uh, and frequently the different measures that the major private payers, uh, the Anthems, United's, the uh, um, Aetna's, the Blues plans uh, may also uh, put on I think it is time now for some government leadership uh, to try to um, convene to get what would generally become a more unified uh, set of measures. I've been very uneasy about doing that uh, up until now uh, because I think uh, the science of uh, the metric measurement was uh, too early, uh, but I and I think it is obviously still evolving. Uh, but I think it is time to try to do that uh, in a more coordinated uh, way. 
uh, putting a lot of emphasis on, on something we heard this morning, which uh, is obvious but gets lost in the shuffle, uh, which is uh, remembering that first and foremost, it has to be uh, in, uh, what's important to the patients. Uh, it doesn't have to be and shouldn't be only what's important to the patient, uh, but that has to be uh, a key uh, component. Um, not just uh, because uh, that ought to be driving uh, how care is, uh, is provided, especially for us market-based economist types. Uh, it, the patient can define better what's important to the patient, what matters than uh, any other uh, individuals, even if objectively they may re be regarded uh, as knowing more about the particular area. Uh, that doesn't mean uh, it's what uh, the patient uh, values, even with a reasonable amount of, uh, of information. Um, it does uh, indicate that uh, it, it requires a willingness for public and <coughs> private sectors uh, to work together uh, in a way that uh, has not uh, happened very often. Uh, and to the extent it's possible, I know that uh, there have been some efforts going on in the last year uh, that involve uh, AHIP and CMS and many other private uh, groups to use administrative data. Uh, it would certainly make life much better to have that be a key but not exclusive focus uh, on how you collect data so that you can try to minimize the uh, burdens that we are placing on institutions and clinicians uh, in getting this data. It, 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 it must be overwhelming to both the institutions and the clinicians because of all the different demands that various uh, payers or other standards or boards uh, put uh, in terms of what they have to uh, provide. Uh, and again, really focus on the fact uh, that uh, it's not the right treatment if it doesn't get at what matters to the patient. Uh, and even if it is technically correct and efficiently provided, if there's an error in the diagnosis uh, or an error in the treatment chosen given the diagnosis, uh, everything else kind of falls apart. Uh, and many of our, our current measurement systems uh, open themselves up to that kind of a, uh, of a problem. The second thing is gonna be it's time for the, uh, the public sector uh, and Medicare uh, to make some decisions about how to move forward um, on trying to look at value-based uh, care, again, defining, uh, making sure that the key to that uh, is um, what matters to patients in terms of how you define uh, that, uh, that quality. Um, I, I think we are ready to take our best shot <coughs> now at what the next venture uh, of payment systems in, the, in Medicare uh, ought to look like, uh, what has gone on with CMMI in, uh, in the past five or six years, I think has helped uh, frequently by telling us what doesn't work, uh, but that's not a trivial uh, issue either. Um, it won't be the last cha change uh, that gets made uh, in Medicare. Uh, Congress meets all the time. Uh, they uh, have Medicare bills uh, most years or used to have some kind of uh, Medicare provisions uh, most years. When they need to change it, they can change it. Um, but I, I think it is time, gather, get some agreement, move <laughs> forward. Uh, the challenge that we can see is when you end up having to rely on the political process, um, uh, you really are likely to get a camel uh, at the result, hardly at Pieta. Uh, and um, we are, are seeing now the struggle uh, clearly identified by MedPAC uh, with implementing uh, the macro legislation, uh, which was very important moving away from the micro unit uh, fee for service system that was the uh, relative value scale. Uh, that was the most dysfunctional way uh, we could pay for uh, physician services, uh, but I think <coughs> MedPAC has been very clear uh, in its recommendation now that we're not really ready for the fee-for-service part, uh, that uh, the merit um, incentive
payment system, the MIPS, uh, to put that into uh, action in January, and we need a, a quick huddling uh, to figure out what to do in, a, in, a, in its place. So it is, I mean, the, the barriers are, uh, are challenging, uh, but I think it's a place where leadership in trying to really keep your focus on what it is you want to do and minimize the burden uh, is uh, something that Medicare needs to do pronto. Uh, thanks, Gail. The, um, uh, you know, this, this question about what um, CMS can do, given that MIPS probably isn't going to arrive on time, is, is a really good question. I know. Mark, uh, uh, in his uh, role with MedPAC, uh, has some thoughts on that. <clears throat> I, I mean, one, one of my questions this is really more a question for Mark that you might address, or you probably will address in your comments. <clears throat> but um, uh, what do you do in January? I don't have that addressed in my comments. Uh, <laughs> good. That's a good, that's a good answer. Ask for a, <laughs> ask for a pause. <clears throat> Uh, do you want me to go on, or do you, do yeah, you no, want well, to discuss MIPS? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I could do the whole 10 minutes on, on, on that, I, I, if you'd like. But if you want to come back to it on questions, I think it is yeah, something. Yeah. Do you, you want to read mine? Yeah. So that's, that, that's it. Okay, so um, we were asked to talk for 10 minutes to try and uh, talk about this translation function between the commercial and um, Medicare. And so I would like to thank all the sponsors for asking me, me here today. I appreciate that. It's always an act of courage to put me in front of a, a microphone, and I appreciate you taking the chance. I'm as nervous as you are. Um, there's a couple of things that I would say in thinking about that, that, that translation, and I am going to say some things that I think overlap clearly on the themes that were made by the other panel and by the speaker, uh, this, by uh, the secretary this morning, but just a couple of things to kind of set the stage. You know, the, the, I think of things in this talk uh, from a cost uh, containment perspective, and in the private and Medicare, commercial and Medicare sections, there are different drivers of the problem. In the commercial sector, the biggest problem as far as I, I'm concerned is provider consolidation and prices. In the Medicare side, it's an influx of the baby boom. You have some utilization issues, but you have mostly control of the prices, with a huge exception being drug prices. And one thought there is to keep in mind is, is as you import <coughs> ideas from the commercial section, sec or from the commercial sector, don't import the prices that they're paying from a dysfunctional uh, market. As you think about po policy there. The second thing that I've run in repeated, into repeatedly throughout my career is people who come from the private sector, well-meaning, thoughtful, all the rest of it, and say, you know, you should take this idea and you should implement it in Medicare. And I would say, you know, think about that, that's, that, that comment just a little, little bit more carefully. These ideas are often incubated in environments that where you have a network of providers, a linkage between a patient and a primary care, you have utilization controls, you have financial incentives for the beneficiary. That idea may be very relevant to the managed care sector, may be very relevant to the ACO sector. It could hit Wild West fee for service and not only not work, could actually become a point of abuse for the yeah. program. Yeah. And so as you carry an idea from the commercial <laughs> sector to the Wild West <laughs> fee for service, Think about how you make sure that that idea works in an environment where some of the tools that you built it on don't actually exist or carry the idea elsewhere uh, into Medicare. Of course, that raises issues about changes that should be made in Medicare, and hopefully I'll say a yeah. few things about that as we yeah. go. The other thing I want to say, and you know, the commercial sector has much greater ability to have uh, financial incentives uh, for the patient or the beneficiary, however you think about it. Uh, financial rewards to choose low-priced providers, value-based insurance design, employee incentive programs, that type of thing. Those types of things in Medicare are much more difficult. They require changes in, in law, even in the demonstration space, the flexibility to adjust the patient liability is much more limited. And then you have this behemoth first dollar coverage wraparound from Med, uh, Medigap and ESI coverage where if you put those incentives <coughs> play in, in place, they can be completely blanked out because the uh, patient can insure themselves against it. And that's something that uh, needs to be addressed in, in Medicare. Just a 
couple of other, these are free of charge based on things that um, people, all that other stuff are being billed for. Um, so, you know, uh, there were comments made on the, on the second or the first panel that said, you know, money drives delivery reform. Money matters, and I believe that very strongly, and payment mechanisms matter. And I also think this, that when providers or, uh, you know, commercial sector actors come to Medicare and say, I have an idea, and that idea, I think, should involve accepting risk. The trade-off for that is, is that the Medicare program should remove regulation in exchange for that. You take risk, you take a, a, a you, you then Medicare walks away from the regulatory requirements because the regulatory requirements are often in place in Wild West fee-for-service for that percentage of providers who will abuse the system. And as long as you're assuming that risk, then Medicare should say, fine, these rules no longer uh, uh, apply, just as a matter of principle. Okay, in case you're wondering what's going on, I am decidedly wondering what's going on because once I start talking, I generally black out. Now what I'm going to do is try and relate much more directly to the first panel some things that they said and how they relate to Medicare. So here we go. First of all, I think it's very, in, I, on primary care, a lot of discussion about primary care, I think it is important that there is a direct linkage between a patient and a primary care pay, um, provider. I think that's something that, um, you know, in ACOs there should be a harder linkage and maybe even in fee-for-service generally and things I ideas like soft lock-ins for uh, beneficiaries. With respect to paying the primary care physicians, we are paying too little and we should pay, we should rebalance the fee schedule and I want the orthopedic surgeon to freak out, but pay less there and move money over to the primary care. He's a big guy, could get right over the table really quickly, but that's <laughs> sort of my, my position there. And we should pay the primary care, uh, care physician on a block basis and I think that allows the primary care physician to spend time doing non-face-to-face type of work and also engage in coordination with specialists and uh, uh, you know social services and that that type of thing I do think it makes sense to pay a lot of health care on a procedure by procedure basis but not um, primary <coughs> care okay uh, benefit design I think that <coughs> the fee-for-service benefit should nobody really talked about this um, so I'll tell you what, I'm going to go to payment reform. I'll come back to that if, there, if there's time. On payment reform, I think that the uh, Medicare program should stay focused on ACOs. I think the evidence has been small, but it is relatively significant. And I think there should be changes there, which I'll say in just a second. I think those kinds of mechanisms should be in place because utilization slowed down in Medicare a lot, also in the commercial sector. But I don't think anybody really understands why and if it were to accelerate again and you would want mechanisms like ACOs around. I think Medicare should move uh, aggressively towards two-sided risk, and I think to make it more attractive, you have an asymmetric risk order, more upside than downside. I believe you can do that in a budget-neutral way. All of these ideas, I believe, can be done in, in a budget-neutral uh, way. Um, and I think, as I said, if you move, uh, embrace two-sided risk, there should be a lot less regulatory uh, re requirement when the ACO does that. I think uh, there should be some support for small ACOs by scaling the risk to the volume of their um, business. Mm -hmm. I think we should be promoting all-payer ACO collaboratives like the Vermont initiatives, which brings together the commercial Medicare and Medicaid and has all of the sig hopefully will get all of the signals um, aligned. And I think at, uh, drugs should be added to the ACO targets. It's a huge technical problem, but I think it is something that actually could should be pursued and, and could be, um, uh, you know, you could get there. Uh, on tar uh, bundling, and I thought I was going to sort of explain some of the problems with bundling. I think you got an incredible lesson in the bundling problems from uh, uh, Kevin on, on uh, his experiences and the directions he was he, he was going. The notion that it can result in more episodes, it doesn't stop episodes that that, that shouldn't happen, and I worry it undermines population-based mo <coughs> models and sort of has the savings come out below the population level where the population level would have an incentive to avoid uh, a surgery that was completely unnecessary. I worry that you can refragment the system and still be generating um, uh, volume. 
The other thing is, is and you know, I think that there are a lot of bundling problems that are being, or models that are being put forward that I see as sort of more motivated about protecting specialist revenue really than about uh, reorganizing care. Now that said, I wouldn't say no bundle, zero, all the rest of it. I think there are, and I think surgery and uh, post-acute care related to surgery makes a lot of sense, and so I wouldn't say hell no, but I say it, it should be targeted and somewhat limited. I'm going to finish up with quality. I didn't think I was going to talk about quality, but everybody else did, and this is a panel where you're supposed to free form things, which is also why I'm really nervous. Um, <laughs> So the last thing I'll say about um, uh, quality is, is you heard this, you know, a relatively consistent comments of like, we're measuring too much and we're measuring the wrong stuff. Anybody who has followed the MedPAC folks, the, you know, MedPAC has been on a pretty full tilt rant on this point for, um, or a considered conversation on this point for uh, many years. I think this is a place where Medicare could lead. I think if Medicare said there is a small number of outcomes-based measures and that would allow Medicaid and the commercial <coughs> sector to align around those and say this is what we're going to do for payment purposes and leave flexibility for providers to measure uh, and systems to measure their quality below that and move performance as they see fit, I think that would help remove the burden. And notice that in outcomes-based measures in many ways, there are certain forms of those you don't even have to bother the provider to get. And so you could reduce burden, reduce the administrative cost, and at least send from a payment perspective a relatively clear uh, signal. I'm at nine minutes and 54 seconds. I had 10 minutes, and we're done. <laughs> well, Chris, that sets a mark for you. <clears throat> well, let's see. I'm on one second. Uh, I'd say that I have, um, I would say that Mark just gave you one of the most amazing presentations you'll ever hear. Um, he gave you, if, if, you, if, you can kept, if you can keep up with it, that's the issue. I hope someone has recorded it because there are a lot of extraordinarily uh, important ideas that he just conveyed. Um, uh, I think what I'm going to talk a little bit about is just a little bit of observation, uh, Joe, about what happened this morning and, and their application. I, I think we heard something that's really important, which is this whole focus on really a greater, and we just heard from Mark, a, a lot greater emphasis on primary care and and giving them more uh, both resources and flexibility to administer and manage populations uh, from the beginning and down the stream all the way to, and in particular, the two areas that we, th when we, when I talk to plans in the private sector, they'll, they'll talk about two issues in particular, and that's their ability to do referrals better. And, to, and get information for referrals who do a better job and also to manage drug costs downstream. Uh, and they are a much better, they're a much better population to, to rely on in that regard and I think we, we have not maximized the potential there and I think that I've, I've seen that plans are moving in that area and I think that that's encouraging and the private sector uh, I, I think is ahead of uh, Medicare in doing some of those things, and I hope we can transplant that a little bit quicker. The other issue that uh, that I was really frustrated to talk right here about was this whole conversation about quality and quality metrics. And I'm frustrated because this is not new. We have been talking about outcomes-based research and consolidating <coughs> measures for 15 years. I mean, literally for 15 years. And so when this is a novel conclusion, I, I, you kind of have to come to a, um, you, you have to stop for a moment and say, okay, why is that the case? And there are two reasons why it's the case, uh, and they tend to be stakeholder related. One are the plans and, and Medicare all have a whole different array of measures that they want to be applied. And they all are become, after years and years of developing them, have become extraordinarily invested in maintaining them. And so when we can have a panel like this today where we had the plan saying, oh, I'm all for it, 
they're all for it as long as it's their measures, you know. <laughs> and, and, and there's four other plans that that physician is trying to deal with. So, I mean, you got to be a little bit sympathetic to the physician community who's like just going crazy. But on the other hand, I have been in room after room after room with the physicians' communities, and they'll say, anything but outcomes-based research. You know, we, we, I have a measure that it would be much better and you just don't understand it and, and it will require too much on me to do it. And so, you know, let's look in the mirror and say the problem is the very stakeholders who have been embedded in this discourse forever and ever and we use them and we say, okay, let's get around the table and we agree and we agree to let's keep our measures. And, uh, and, and you know, Someone's going to have to say it. Maybe it's the federal government. I don't, I don't care who it is. But uh, this is what we're going to do. And by the way, it will not be perfect. It will not be perfect. There will be a 1.0 and a 2.0 and a 3.0, but we're going to start, okay? And so when I heard Secretary Azar this morning say, we're going to start on drugs and we're going to make mistakes along the way, good. Welcome to the debate. I'm so happy someone is doing it. And when they propose an RFI that provides more flexibility to do some of these innovative things at the primary care level, huge. Let's go for it. Let's maximize the potential. Let's praise them. I'm a Democrat. I praise you, Secretary Azar, for moving that direction if we can do that. And I praise him for doing that on prescription drugs if he can find <coughs> different ways to do it. I suspect he will find that He's going to fall short on the pricing objective that he wanted on drug prices, but, you know, and that competition only goes for, so far when you only have a single source drug and the single source drug can charge whatever they want. And I don't care who you are as a purchaser, you can't do anything about it. So, you know, good luck, but welcome. And, and there's some important contributions that he laid out this morning that I think are, are are encouraging. So, Joe, don't be so discouraging. There's some, some, there's, there's, there's positive. Um, on, on the private sector and on uh, <coughs> bundling, uh, uh, I heard the doctor talk about, I think, a bundling, which I thought was interesting, uh, bundling not by per procedure, but by condition. That seems interesting to me. Um, the only thing that I wonder about is every time, the only, the only thing that Mark has told me, and Gail as well, is that translating some of these concepts in the Medicare program is very, very difficult to do because you have to first, and this is a longer, this is a, another subject that I want to talk about, which is this issue of how do you set the bundle in the first place? How do you set what the amount of money should be? And what is the baseline going forward? And how do you update it over time? Because there's a question about whether you can keep people in the game over a period of time once you have done that. And, and someone has yet to explain to me how that is a sustainable uh, model over a period of time. And, and Alana, you will explain that to us later uh, because I'm sure my time is coming. And I, I can't even figure it out. I can't. Face doesn't work. So. There will be. A oh, I'm, I'm, I have plenty. Um, uh, I do want to say that um, to the employer community, and that I love the employer community, but um, uh, but, <laughs> but Boeing is is an outlier. I mean, we have not seen the engagement of the employer community to the extent that we need to see the, uh, the engagement of the employer community in the cost debate. And uh, you know, it, and there's reasons for that, and I'll explain it. It's it's the third or fourth or fifth priority. That's you know, that's where they are, and so. They'll complain about it, but they'll complain about it not as much as you might would hope because I'm telling you, we need the political cover of the employer community to get the policymakers in Washington to do the type of things the employer community wants Washington to do. Okay? I mean, I'm telling you, Republicans and Democrats, all of them up there will say, if you want me to take on the stakeholder community, the consumers are not going to be enough to do that. I need to have the employer CEO community at the CEO level, engaged and, and promoting policies that they want to see get fixed. Otherwise, don't complain so much because then, then we're going to just go along or merry old way <coughs> and do what CMS always does. They'll do what they can with a Medicare program. But to that end, look at the employer community's recommendations in the general level with stuff that Eric has done. There's some really important things. 
which include a lot of the data information that needs to be out on the table, the transparency information, the outcomes measures that they explicitly are advocating very publicly, the financial incentives for both providers and for uh, uh, patients. There's some very good ideas there. But in order to get those seriously taken and to take on the provider community and the stakeholder community writ large, they need to step up. I'm sorry. And, you know, I, I hear you talking about prescription drug costs, but, you know, uh, let's step up. Um, and what else do I have? I'm almost done, I promise, Joe. Uh, a couple other things. Um, <coughs> attribution, uh, risk adjustment over a period of time, very, very difficult to do within the Medicare program. You're going to say to the provider community, do this. Well, they don't even know who, who's in the program on attribution. We've got to figure out ways to do that. And if we're going to be looking at populations and we're going to ask them to, to uh, seek bundle payment rates, of course, the first thing they're going to say is, well, my patient is sicker than the other patients that are in this bundle. It's not fair. Fix it, Mark. So if you could fix that at some point going forward, I would be very happy to advocate for that. Uh, and lastly, I don't have any time left, but uh, MACRA uh, will is, um, uh, is frustrating, Joe, yes. There's lots and lots of problems with it. Um, I, I looked at, I, I, even MedPAC said maybe we should start all over again, I think. Maybe we should. Um, um, but I will also say one thing about it, which is um, you have to understand what happened with macro. Macro happened because the physicians were tired of the annual debate around SGR. Mm -hmm. Okay, it really wasn't it wasn't <coughs> a discourse about how we're going to change the delivery system, healthcare. That was cover to do that. Okay. And then everyone said, oh, we've done it, and we're going to have something that isn't ACOs, we'll call it APMs, and it will be something creative because it's not the Affordable Care Act, and it will be good, and we'll go ahead and implement it. But then we say, but we should exempt like hundreds of thousands of people from its rules, and therefore, guess what? It's not going to happen. Um, so uh, I, I would suspect it was done in an unrealistic way. I think the incentives are all... Um, wrong. Uh, I, would, I would follow some of Mark's prescriptions in that regard, and I think in the Q&A you should ask him some questions about macro, about what we should do next. So with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Lanhi. So I guess I'm here to channel Joe and dash all your hopes and dreams about, uh, about what's next. So I, um, let me just say I think there's a couple of different themes that, that are important to think about as we uh, have this discussion. The first is what is the proper locus of a lot of this activity? Is it the federal government? Is it state governments? And then within the federal government, how much of this can be accomplished via administrative action uh, <coughs> directly by the agency uh, or its component parts versus the need for an act of Congress? That's one issue that the Secretary didn't get into as much this morning. But I think it's an open question how much the, the administration is going to be able to do on its own and I think that relates in part to how aggressively they're willing to use CMMI, which has been um, an area of skepticism. I, I've, I've had my own um, qualms with it, and I think a lot of conservatives have expressed some skepticism about CMMI. But ultimately, it falls to this question of how much authority the administration is actually <coughs> going to be able to exercise on its own. Now, I, I think the states should not be ignored because one of the issues that came up earlier was scope of practice laws. Well, that's something that states could very easily decide they wanted to address. Uh, in the absence of federal action. So I, I think even if uh, we are gridlocked at the federal level, and even if there is an issue with how much authority this administration, or any administration for that matter, actually has to move the needle, uh, the broader question then is, okay, what might governors and what might states do, <coughs> and how can they leverage their Medicaid programs, for example, to begin to, to move in the direction that we want to see as we make this transition. So th that's sort of the first set of questions is around, where people think this activity should take place and, and where there might be some promise to move the ball forward. Um, the second issue is the, is the politics. I know no one likes to talk about politics in this town, I get it. But the, 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 the <laughs> politics actually are very important here because um, just as with the North Koreans, the era of strategic patience may be over when it comes to the, to the migration toward value. And what I mean by that is this. Um, 
I think, Chris, I think you made a very good point, which is that employers have the opportunity to jumpstart this discussion. And uh, this is not going to be something that's going to happen <coughs> above the radar. And precisely for that reason, this may be something that actually happens. Because so long as you don't need to be dealing with the ACA wars, which will continue, no doubt, I think you can actually make some progress here. And I think that there is a shift at the agency. Alex Azar is a very different kind of secretary from what Tom Price was in a lot of ways. Um, Alex, I think, the secretary, I think, represents a... Um, uh, a, a much more traditional view of the need for the agency to take an aggressive role in <coughs> facilitating this migration to value. And I think that that change is actually very meaningful. So the, the, the political will, I think, is there in this administration. That's a sense I get at least. And, and in that sense, it matches up with kind of what I think this town is able to handle right now, uh, which is not a lot, uh, frankly. I, I, I don't think we can expect, for example, the Congress to come in and, and, and be super active on any of these issues. Yes, a lot of bills come up on Medicare and Medicaid. How many of them actually get acted on? Uh, precious few. And so I think that the need for administrative action, the, the, the need for there to be some kind of motivation, again, I think employers can provide that, I think will be a very, very helpful um, set of motivating factors as we move into uh, 2019. And I would suggest that a lot of this is 2019 activity uh, because we're all about to shut things down for the election in a few, in a few weeks. So, um, you know, there, there is the potential for, I think, uh, the political supply to match the political demand when it comes to under the radar type activity, which is largely, I think, what we are all in the vein of talking about. So with that, I, I will end early and we can yeah. have a discussion. That's, uh, that's great. Now, uh, you're not going to make me any less pessimistic, <laughs> no matter which, but, uh, but uh, you know, your, your point about CMMI I think is important. Well, yeah. one thing I would observe, uh, the, uh, uh, towards the end of the Obama administration, they <clears throat> uh, pushed forward some uh, mandatory demonstrations. Right. And uh, there's a lesson there, it's not the one you think I'm gonna say, uh, because they did it right. Uh, they didn't just say we're gonna require it. They, they, they did it through a federal register process. Mm -hmm. uh, they asked for, for comments. Uh, they didn't just say, we have the authority. They do have the authority. Uh, uh, and so that part of it is very important uh, uh, to, uh, to, to realize that uh, while you may have the authority to, to order, order physicians or others to do something, that doesn't mean that that's a smart thing either politically or, or in terms of the way healthcare is delivered. Um, uh, do people want to take issue with uh, others' comments here on the panel before we go to questions from the audience? Um, I had, uh, <coughs> I, I really want just, um, be, I think we were very close and consistent uh, with our comments of focusing on, uh, on slightly uh, different aspects of what we had heard previously. Um, the notion of having uh, CMS take the leadership in uh, <coughs> developing a single, uh, with some branches, set of metrics uh, that uh, could then be um, strongly encouraged uh, for use by uh, private as well as other public, other level public uh, payers uh, when looking at outcomes um, seem pretty consistent. Is there, um, is there a downside about having, is there a way for them to do it in their organizational structure so that when you go from 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0, which I believe will happen, you don't necessarily have to go through the APA process. Uh, and the reason I raise that uh, is because, um, to my understanding, the conditions of participation have never been reopened because no one thought they could ever be reclosed uh, if that happened. And so what I would like to do is be able to mimic the HEDIS 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and not the Medicare conditions of participation. So I don't know whether, I mean, it's a small technical but non-trivial issue. Uh, and 
uh, with at least one lawyer on the panel. I don't know whether that will answer it. But I think that's, that, is, that needs to be given some thought because I think we are very consistent <coughs> in directionally what we want to do and for the reasons we want to do it, uh, you know, exactly whether how you define the condition and, and not get hung up on the procedure so you don't get into bundling proliferation or wrong focus, I think we all agree is, uh, is important. So I, that's the only thing I'm, I'm not sure about because it really, it, it came in in some way in all of our comments. I, I think that's worthy of exploration, and I, I, I'm not even willing to take off, you know, conditions of participation off the table because we, we need to move move things. But, uh, but um, I, I want to say something that Lon he said was is true. Uh, one is that, um, you know, in this town, until recently, uh, people. And I think still over focus on um, the Congress. Uh, you know, uh, the Congress is not where the action is. The Congress, it, whether it's a Democratic administration or Republican administration, until the Congress can reclaim its rightful role in <coughs> oversight and legislation, the executive branch fills the void. And that's what we're seeing here. We saw it in Obama, we saw it in Clinton, we saw it in Bush, and we'll see it in, in the Trump administration too. And, and to that end, I think they will suddenly, those who were critical about the excess authority of CMMI will suddenly become converts. Uh, and and I, I predict to you that while there may be some savings pulled out through rescissions that we've just heard about in recent weeks, uh, the authority will not be diminished. And I think that there will be um, some real ability, both <coughs> from, from a positive and my, from my party's perspective, probably a negative perspective. But in any scenario, I think that there, there will be roads to follow and to watch very carefully. Um, and, 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 uh, and, the, and the last thing I want to agree with him was that, um, that ACA is the shiny object of discontent and polarization and political, you know, polarization and, politis and, 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 and politics, but the reality is there's so few people day to day who really can understand or engage in the issues of delivery reform, and, and, and that is to its benefit uh, in Washington. I, I always was jealous of the people who weren't doing my issue in healthcare. If they had any other second tier or third tier issue, even though it's the core of what we do in healthcare, you can get so much more done because so, few, so many fewer people are really engaged on that front. And it will have to be done in careful ways because if it gets too political, then in the end it blows up. Um, and to Mark's point, you can do a lot of this in the world of budget neutral um, dynamics. Um, you can, by the way, be very disruptive in budget neutral dynamics, I will say that too. Um, but, uh, but you'll have to mitigate and moderate that approach. But there are some meaningful things that can be done at the executive branch, and I would watch the agencies very carefully to that end. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, in the interest of time, let's uh, move to the audience. Uh, and uh, please identify yourself, wait for the microphone and uh, uh, make your statement uh, seem like a question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that, that change. Was good. Um, that I'm taking Jerry it. Bass, and I used a hospital CFO in, in Seattle and D.C., um, former life. The, uh, the, the most significant thing I've seen in, the, in during the 40 years I was doing all that was the DRG passes of DRGs back in the 82, 83 era. Um, and that was the federal government somehow getting past the DRGs to make a significant change uh, in, in the cost structure and payment structure. So the question really gets to, you know, how do we make the same significant change in the physician payment structure uh, to, you know, everyone says primary care is where the action should be and therefore we should change that. And i certainly seen where the radiologists and a lot of the specialists have got significant salaries where the primaries happen. So how do, how do we do that to make, to make it work? And the bundling, you know, DRGs addresses your bundling issues. I think you went out there as far as who, who does the uh, 
you know, as sick as patients, they had outliers and all that type of thing. So they've been effectively able to do that. Well, okay, let's, years. let's yeah. pick a question. So. Yeah. Um, DRGs, uh, by the way, uh, excluded a, a, at least one component called quality. Uh, it was completely focused on uh, a payment amount for a condition, uh, even if the condition that was assumed in uh, was the wrong condition. Uh, so it, it was a major step forward in, in 1983, uh, but not really um, the step forward uh, you know, that it might have uh, seen. I'm going to let some. I just wanted to clarify the uh, the portion about DRG. <coughs> well, to, well, to pick up there, I mean, to the extent that there are other models, either local or state, you know, run that try and do that, and then the federal government can look at that might help. I think there's some things that Chris said that matter here. That uh, if you had a coalition. And I mean, in some ways, I'm surprised that the primary care, you know, uh, advocacy groups are not more vocal than they are. And if they had the backing of, say, the employers saying that this makes sense, even though it's a change in Medicare, it drives back through the, because uh, the physician fee schedule drives what goes on in the commercial sector. <coughs> that would make some sense to me. But I want to be very clear. I don't know how to get, get it done. I mean. It would, at this point, require changes in law to do it the way I described it. You can do more administrative stuff in the fee schedule where you can kind of take steps to giving blockier patients or payments to uh, certain physicians, and CMS has done that. But they have certain limitations uh, given the fact that they're administrative actions. But you can also take some administrative actions also consistent with what several people here are saying on the panel, move what you can through an administrative. I also completely buy the CMI comments, you know, you're against it until you realize how much power and ability to affect change. You could also try and run some of this through uh, CMMI types of ideas, activities, sorry. Yeah, Kevin Bozick, I, I appreciate the comments from the panel and I wanted to violently agree with Mark and Chris that primary care physicians are grossly underpaid and that a shift in resources to primary care is necessary. I would say that the, the question I have for you though is that primary care physicians need a way to engage specialists other than fee for service. And so, so that because care innovation happens at the condition level, like <coughs> primary care physicians cannot innovate in mental health care and diabetes and congestive heart failure and chronic pain, which I manage, they're just not capable of that. The expertise resides elsewhere, but if their only mechanism is to hold on to that patient as long as they can and then farm them out for procedures that are done and paid in a fee-for-service mechanism, you're not going to incentivize that type of innovation. So I've heard, I've heard both Chris and Mark say that they're, they're bearish on bundle payments. I am very bearish on bundle payments at the procedure level, but I think if you can move upstream from that and incentivize, and it's Part of the problem is instead of categorizing physicians as orthopedic surgeons <coughs> and nephrologists, and we have to say that there are groups of providers that manage pain and manage heart disease and manage diabetes, and that we have to figure out a way to pay them to innovate and manage care for those conditions. So I'm curious at how you how you would in incentivize and how you would see in incentivizing specialists differently under this primary care model that we all agree is, is the direction we need to go. Um. Well, let me let me give a, at least a, a, a start to this. Um, I think, uh, in maybe uh, not intended, but you have just given a compelling answer as to why all of the discussions we've been hearing this morning are going to be so much harder uh, outside of an integrated type of uh, model, which includes both primary uh, care physicians and specialists. Uh, we tend to talk about what primary care physicians make as a group versus specialists. Uh, you have to remember, in, in the United States, we tend to include uh, OB-GYN and pediatrics uh, in uh, our primary care definition, which uh, relative to some of the specialties is fine. <coughs> Most other countries don't do that. It just means we're even much more distorted toward our, our specialist weight. Um, I'm on uh, the board of, of Geisinger, and they do both their patients and they also 
uh, work with other payers who are, are not using um, employed uh, physician models. Getting to that becoming a much more dominant way of delivering care uh, where you're not just mimicking fee-for-service uh, as happens in many uh, Medicare Advantage plans really does allow for a much easier way for the specialist uh, to integrate. You, do, you think about the struggle that a patient that has a complex condition has when somebody has to be connecting uh, the care and physician services being provided by people who normally don't interact with each other. Uh, it just becomes uh, very hard to think about how outside of a larger structure uh, that happens. The concern I have is people have not in this country tended to vote with their feet going into these large integrated at-risk groups that allow, if done well, so much of what we talked about uh, to occur. And in many places, uh, like Washington, for example, uh, they don't really exist except for a relatively smaller version of Kaiser that uh, doesn't own its own hospitals and has not had the same kind of success as Kaiser uh, West Coast. So I, I just find that without, it, they can be virtual. They don't, I mean, I'm, I like that. The secretary was commenting on the, the importance of including virtual and not just bricks and mortar. And some of the early panelists also commented on getting away from just thinking on a bricks and mortar basis. But unless you have that kind of an integrated at-risk uh, grouping, uh, and just being an MA plan doesn't necessarily do anything on that, but it allows you to overcome some of these barriers. I just don't know how it happens anymore uh, because of all of the concerns uh, that you've raised and others that episode, even, even bundling for conditions is better than micro-level fee-for-service where you're paying for each little unit despite the um, incentive to proliferate, uh, proliferate uh, bundles uh, and maybe miss the point of what's actually driving the patient's uh, perceived problem. Um, I just don't know how you get away from that if you don't have virtual or real integrated care that allows a more easier crossing of um, care uh, among all the various specialists. And the sicker the patient, the more critical it is. And uh, I, I agree with that. I also wanted to say up front to you that I really appreciate your thinking on this issue. I've been in a lot of rooms with orthopedic surgeons and orthopedic surgeon associations, and they generally do not speak the way you speak. Me too, and I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet, colleagues that, I'll uh, bet you do. Done. And so I wanted to just make sure that that was said. To, you know, whatever, you know, micro disagreements we have uh, between us, I do want to say that because I thought your, your, your experience was very informative and your comments have been very uh, constructive. So the first thing I would have said, not as articulately as, you know, it needs to be truly in an integrated system, which is why I tend towards population-based types of models like an ACO where you kind of have at least, or a managed care uh, program, which doesn't mean any of them are doing it right, but at least the structure is there to do that. I tend to think of the way you have to, to overcome that, you have to, to think about it that way. What I was saying for the block payment for primary care, which I think is a, me a, a partial measure, is, is that if it gives the resources and the flexibility, I'm not tied to you know, the you know, uh, visit and bill uh, <coughs> type of model, I at least have some greater flexibility to coordinate and potentially bring you know, people close to the practice. So in, say in the behavioral health, I feel like uh, this is highly simplistic. I'm sure I don't know what I'm talking about entirely, but you know that there's two models. You can either put a behavioral health person near the primary care practice to help backstop the primary care physician who often doesn't have a lot of that experience, or alternatively, you start saying, no, it's an outpatient model, and you start directing and trying to capture 
behavioral health, you know, at a specific, you know, center. And, you know, I've seen different models around the country. But my only point on block pain, the uh, primary care, was is to give them some greater flexibility, recognizing you probably don't get over all the barriers unless you're really in a truly um, operational uh, integrated uh, system. Uh, we probably have time for one quick question and one very quick answer. No, wait. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was just trying to, just trying to help. Good morning. Right. Thanks for being here. I'm Robin Fleming. I'm a health policy fellow with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, I'm curious about, I, I've sent some frustration with the lack of movement here um, among the panels today. And I'm curious about your thoughts on Amazon, Walmart, CVS, Aetna, um, their efforts to sort of create their own okay. health systems um, and how you think, w whether you think there might be opportunities in the public and private space um, for innovation in those efforts. I'm highly skeptical about the Amazon Berkshire Hathaway, um, J.P. Morgan. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I think their uh, initially uh, clear focus is on reducing their own employee health care costs and making it easier for employees to uh, get information, to book appointments online, to get results, much of which, by the way, the better payers uh, do to any of the employers who either request it or will tolerate that as a, a service because they all do them. Uh, and the reason I'm so skeptical about their moving the cost needle uh, is that uh, when you have uh, five percent of the uh, population using fifty percent of the dollars and fifty percent of the population using three percent of the dollars they're much more likely uh, to have the fifty percent of the population using the three percent of the dollars and you can make them as efficient as you want you're not going to do much but Amazon has done some things uh, in terms of retail uh, sales pretty well uh, not so much Whole Foods as a Whole Foods customer but uh, some of their uh, retail uh, work has certainly made it more convenient, so it'll be interesting to see. The other integration, CVS Aetna, uh, is a, a more traditional vertical uh, integration minus the hospital, so if you're a hospital, watch out. Uh, uh, United Healthcare has also been doing vertical integration minus the hospital, uh, and of course to counter that, uh, many of the large hospital systems are acquiring horizontally uh, as many hospitals so uh, they can, as uh, Paul Ginsburg has noted on a number of occasions and other people, uh, use their consolidation to up prices. Uh, and I'll just say uh, a little more skeptical too because uh, no matter how big they are, they don't have a huge workforce. The workforce doesn't have a lot of leverage to negotiate better prices. And in the world of negotiation that Paul and uh, consolidation that Paul has talked about greatly, I think people are skeptical. Uh, lastly, they have a workforce that's very likes their health care a lot. Um, my experience with many of those populations, they provide very, very gold-plated type yeah. benefits. They're they're not um, they're not ones to alienate their employees right now. Um, the, the workforce is very small and very competitive right now. Add that all up, I wouldn't hold my breath for huge, huge interventions that change the market, particularly beyond the, the people that they currently employ. You know, it must be a serious inter uh, initiative because they put out the press release before they hired anybody. <laughs> uh, 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 so with that, <laughs> Uh, I want to thank you all for uh, attending this conference, and please join me in thanking the panel. Thank